executive of the United States, starting with George Washington. This program is about two and a half hours. No event could have filled me with greater anxieties than that of which the notification was transmitted by your order. On the one hand, I was summoned by my country, whose voice I can never hear but with veneration and love. On the other hand, the magnitude and difficulty of the trust to which the voice of my country called me could not but overwhelm with despondence one who ought to be peculiarly conscious of his own deficiencies. George Washington, First Inaugural Address, April 30th, 1789. He was 57 when he became the nation's first president, chosen by all 69 members of the Electoral College and to this day the only person unanimously elected to office. George Washington was one of the most famous men in the world by that time. His years as a Virginia statesman, as commander-in-chief of the Revolutionary Forces, and as president of the Constitutional Convention had secured him the kind of reputation few questioned. He was a towering figure physically as well, nearly six foot three and about 200 pounds, with a bony muscular frame and size 13 boots. He had auburn hair, blue-gray eyes, and false teeth, which contrary to conventional wisdom, weren't made of wood. Some sets were carved out of hippopotamus tusks and others crafted from the teeth of cows. None of them fit him very well, and it's likely he was often in pain as a result. He was an Episcopalian and a Freemason who dressed stylishly, loved to dance, and enjoyed spending evenings reading aloud to his wife. His favorite spot on earth was Mount Vernon, an inherited family estate located just south of what is now Washington, D.C. His greatest wish, he wrote, was to live and die there. When he was 26, he married Martha Dandridge Custis, reputedly the wealthiest widow in Virginia, who added 17,000 acres of land to Washington's 5,000 and 300 slaves to his 49. She was also a mother of two, and Washington became a devoted stepfather to young Jackie and Patsy. The Washingtons never had children of their own. He served from 1789 to 1797. John Adams was his vice president, Thomas Jefferson his Secretary of State. He considered himself a political centrist, and it was to his chagrin that his administration coincided with the emergence of the nation's first two political parties, the Democratic Republicans under Jefferson and the Federalist under Alexander Hamilton. Refusing a third term, Washington retired to Mount Vernon in March of 1797. Once again, friends and associates called him general, a designation he preferred to president. After riding across his estate on horseback one snowy December afternoon, he developed a sore throat, which was later complicated by difficulty breathing. Three doctors attended him, bleeding him four times, a conventional treatment of the day. But his condition worsened, and he died shortly after 10 p.m. on December 14, 1799. He was 67. Welcome to C-SPAN's American President Series, produced by Mark Farkas. This is the first of 41 stops throughout the rest of this year. And you can see on this March day, it is snowing, it is raining, it is cold. But this house is open for tourists, which we might see as we go through the next couple of hours. And we're going to have here at our microphones a number of people, including Richard Norton Smith, who has written the book Make the Patriarch, not Matriarch. And Richard, uh, Richard Smith, this bed right here is was where George Washington died. Well, the story died. ended. Except, of course, the story never ended. 200 years later, we're gathering. This is the year, of course, the bicentennial of George Washington's death, which on some level might seem an odd thing to observe, not exactly celebrate. And yet it really is an opportunity for millions of Americans uh, to meet Washington, uh, to live with Washington again. Um, fascinating man so much more interesting than, uh, than the marble statue in the city parks 
or the, uh, the face on the dollar bill. We're going to also take a tour of Mount Vernon. We're going to meet Jim Reese, who is the resident director of Mount Vernon. And we're also going to meet Gladys Tansel, historical interpreter and a descendant of a Mount Vernon slave. And we're going to take your calls all throughout this program, find out what you think of George Washington, what you know about him, what you don't know, and what you'd like to ask some of our experts. Do you have a favorite story about what he would be like as a person? As a person? Uh, yeah, well, it, it's more the, the, the cost that he paid. He, he stopped being a person along in uh, midlife, and he became an icon. He became a deity, uh, first in the revolution and then subsequently afterwards, because we needed a deity in this country. This wasn't a nation. Uh, we existed as a nation on paper only. And uh, the one thing that everyone agreed on was George Washington. And, uh, and so we embalmed him, in a sense, before he was uh, dead. And there's a marvelous story that I found here at Mount Vernon, doing some research uh, in the archives here. And it was told by his adopted granddaughter, Nellie Park Custis, not long before she died. And it suggests the price he paid. And um, Washington was very fond of children. He was very sensitive about the fact that he had no children of his own. And at the end of a long day during the presidency, he would leave his office and walk down the hall into a room where Nellie and her playmates were. And he enjoyed seeing children play. And the moment they realized that they were in the presence of the man called Great Washington, they froze. And he waited, and they remained frozen. And eventually, rather put out, he would turn on his heel and walk out of the room. And to me, that was an epiphany. That, that explained uh, the, some of the cost that Washington paid. Um, he had uh, carved the statue of his own reputation, and then he couldn't climb down off the pedestal. We have eight cameras here today, and I don't know if we can do this now, but uh, we have a camera outside that's in front of the house. Uh, Richard Norton Smith loves to talk about that. Not that shot. That is a shot from what is out on the lawn right behind where that camera is, is the Potomac River, and it's hard to even see because it's so foggy and cloudy. But that's the shot I want you to explain. Sure. Well, if you look at the, if you look at the house, it's certainly one of the most famous um, images in, in all of American history, it's deceptive. And in some ways, uh, so is Washington. The house looks like a model of symmetry. That great cupola with the, uh, the pediment in front. And of course, on top of the cupola, uh, the world's most, fam most famous soldier put a dove of peace uh, for a weather vane. Interesting statement in itself. But if you pan back and look at the house, you will notice, first of all, that it is not one house, but, all right, it's, uh, Washington took uh, an existing home that, that was here in uh, 1735 that he inherited from his uh, half-brother Lawrence. Here we go. The center of that house, underneath the pediment, you look at the doorway, and if you look closely, you'll see it's not symmetrical. The windows are not perfectly lined up. But you have to look very close. What Washington did was he took that original house in which we are sitting this morning, a house of eight rooms and a great central passageway, which was a very conventional uh, Virginia home at that time. And over the years, he added to it, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen is the North Wing, which contains the banquet hall, the new room. That was the public stage, uh, a theater almost, where Washington for example, first learned that he was to be president of the United States. On the right-hand side of the screen, the south wing is an entirely private wing. That's where the Washington's bedroom is located. That's where his study is located. And then, of course, the house is flanked by those very graceful uh, colonnades, outbuildings. Uh, but the fact is that Washington deliberately, over the years, a self-taught architect, just as he was a self-taught military expert, uh, self-taught government and legal expert, um, he took a conventional house and he turned it into something very different. And that's a metaphor for what he did with his own life. We have a book in my hand here that uh, is called Patriarch, and it's a book that was uh, written by Richard Norton Smith. He appeared on Book Notes a long time ago. What year did you write this book? Mm, boy, uh, 93. It was published in 93. Still can get it. And I know I can yeah, get, you get it in the gift it's, shop. Here. It's out there and it's here, and of course it's also in paperback. We have a call from Tallahassee, Florida to start off uh, our caller's participation. Go ahead, Tallahassee. You're on with Richard Norton Smith. Hello, Tallahassee. Can you hear us? 
Tallahassee cannot hear us, I gather. Okay, let's come back to Mr. Smith. Let's look at first some personal facts on George Washington that we have. Uh, give us what you know about him. How tall was he, for instance? Well, Washington uh, walked into a room and owned the room, as they say. Uh, he was six feet three inches tall. He towered half a foot over his contemporaries. He was a giant of a figure. Uh, one of the problems, Gilbert Stewart, no less, said that capturing Washington on canvas was the hardest thing he ever did. And in fact, Washington's own relatives complained that uh, no painter ever really managed to convey the essence of his character. He was a charismatic figure all his life. Um, never wore a wig, contrary to the popular notion. Uh, as a young man, he had auburn hair. Uh, it turned uh, gray later. But uh, I always like to say that all the founding fathers, Hamilton, Jefferson, Washington, Lafayette, were all redheads. So you owe your liberties to, uh, to redheads. Um, the false teeth is a false story. Um, the fact is um, Washington started losing his teeth when he was 22. He liked to crack Brazil nuts between his jaws. That story is from John Adams. And uh, subsequently, uh, he was in more or less constant agony. And uh, when he became president, he uh, went to a Philadelphia dentist who had a state-of-the-art set of dentures made from hippopotamus tusk with one hole carved in the uh, uh, device to fit over his one remaining tooth, which was pretty painful. And he was do dosed liberally uh, throughout his presidency with laudanum. When did he marry? Married in 1759. Um, Martha Custis, a young widow uh, who was a year older than he was, uh, one of the richest women in Virginia, um, who had four children in her life. All of them would die young, two in infancy. Uh, one accompanied Washington in the Revolution and uh, died just after Yorktown. Where was he born? He was born in Westmoreland County, Virginia, um, which is also, by the way, a, a birthplace of two other presidents, uh, James Madison and James Monroe. We're, we're born in the same area. About an, hour, about an hour and a half drive from here. That's right. Not too far from um, uh, the Lee, the Robert E. Lee uh, home, birthplace. We're from Callaway. Let's go to Harrisville, Pennsylvania. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Brian. Good morning, Mr. Smith. Um, I had one comment and uh, one question that I hope uh, you'll be able to answer. Uh, the question was, I know there's traveling a exhibition that had been in New York that is scheduled to be in like Richmond, Atlanta, Chicago of uh, George Washington Revealed, I believe it's called. And it's in uh, association with the Mount Vernon Ladies Association had put it on. And I wondered if anyone could tell me the dates when it will be in Richmond and where it will be in Richmond. And then my comment is um, I've been interested in Washington since I was about 13 years old. And I've spent the last couple of years reading uh, through the excellent series that the University Press of Virginia has done on his papers. And um, although I have read Mr. Smith's book, and I enjoyed it very much, there are so many wonderful biographies of Washington out there, but I really would encourage people, um, if they really do want to get a feel of what he actually is like, to uh, get an interlibrary loan and uh, get some of these wonderful volumes that uh, the University Press of Virginia has been working on, because... Uh, it's, you will be surprised in many, many ways. Give us an to, example. Pardon Call, me? Give us an example of well, something that surprised you. Harrisville is about uh, 20 miles south of what was Venango, which was the first place George Washington went on his mission to the French. It's now Franklin, Pennsylvania, in western Pennsylvania. And uh, just because I'm so familiar with many of the places he's been in western Pennsylvania, that's another reason I've uh, taken an interest in him. But uh, I think people would be just surprised, at, um, especially when he's a young man, how passionate he is about um, caring about the soldiers when he was uh, the colonel of the Virginia militia and stuck in Winchester. And it was like the perfect training ground, ground for what he had to go through in the revolution in terms of trying to keep the army together. Let me just ask you one question before we get Richard Norton Smith's reaction. Why are you so interested in all this? Um, it's it, it's it's just kind of a personal deal. It's um, I actually did live in Richmond for a few months and stuff, and it just seems like my paths are kind of always crossing where George Washington has been in a number of different ways. I just had an opportunity to uh, 
visit relatives in uh, Madison, New Jersey, and see Morristown, et cetera, and stuff like that. It just seems to always keep cropping up, and I've enjoyed reading. He's such a wonderful writer. That's something else I don't think people realize. He's, I admire someone who's a very clear and concise writer. I used to do some of that myself for the government. And uh, George Washington was a very good writer. Thank you very much. Good start on our calls. She's absolutely right about the surprising Washington, and including his intellectual gifts. You know, he's not as quotable as Jefferson. He's not as outspoken as Adams. He's not as learned as Madison. He's not as versatile as Franklin. And yet he is a marvelously lucid writer. Uh, and again, surprising. Uh, we read a short quote from a, from a letter which will reinforce just what she said. He came back from the Constitutional Convention in 1787 and he needed to find a gardener for this estate. And at length, he found a hard-drinking candidate uh, who was otherwise acceptable. And uh, he drew up a contract binding the candidate to perform his duties sober for a year. Quote, Washington writes, if allowed four dollars at Christmas with which to be drunk four days and four nights, two dollars at Easter to effect the same purpose, two dollars at Whitsuntide to be drunk for two days, a dram in the morning, and a drink of grog at dinner and at noon. Um, <laughs> there's a man who understands human nature. Um, by the way, her question about the, the traveling exhibit, I'm sure Jim Reese could answer that. He's going to be with us uh, in just a second. Let me grab a call from Denver, and then we'll introduce you to Jim Reese. Go ahead, Denver. You're on the air. Yes, um, yes I am a black American, um, the, the descendant of slaves. And to me, it is so easy for white people to get on TV and on the radio and vouch about the character, especially about people who they did not know personally, who would enslave a whole group of people. I, and one last thing, I hear um, white commentators, they'd be on TV talking, well, I never owned any slaves. The United States of America condoned it. The American institutions allowed it. And to me, until those governments apologize for the atrocities held down against black people. I think Washington is no better than Adolf Hitler and should not be put on no, as no, on no pedestal as no icon. I think he was a terrible individual. And as a matter of fact, there's no way in the world you can tell me he had too much civilization in him because you don't do human beings like that. That's a rotten thing to do. Thank you so very much. Have a good day. Thanks for your call, Mr. Smith. Well, as far as passing judgment on people you don't know, unfortunately, that's what every historian and every biographer uh, does for a living. What you try to do is not so much pass judgment, but to try and turn the clock back, not to apply the standards that we would regard as civilized uh, or, or conventional in our own time, uh, but to live with someone in another time, in his own time, to see his world through his eyes, to stand in his shoes, to climb inside his skin, if possible. And one of the things about Washington, one of the recurring themes about Washington's life, uh, he wasn't born a great man. Uh, he was a very conventional uh, Virginia aspiring aristocrat in many ways with very conventional views about slavery as a young man. The greatness about Washington is that he outgrew his youthful conventions. He outgrew many of his youthful ambitions and he certainly outgrew his youthful views on slavery. Uh, this was a man who came to realize fighting a revolution uh, for individual liberty that it was not simply a paradox, but it was rank hypocrisy uh, to be fighting such a war uh, while enslaving uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans. This was a man who, in his own will, unlike, unfortunately, others of the founders, uh, took pains to uh, free his slaves uh, upon the death of his, uh, of his wife. This was a man who, from middle age on, refused to buy or sell a slave, refused to break up slave families, um, so this is not to, again, not to justify the institution, but to try and understand a man of goodwill who was in many ways trapped in an institution, not of his own making. Uh, he told a friend not long before he died that the one fear he had about the future of the United States was that the South, his native region, would not find a way to peacefully evolve out of a slave economy. And in fact, he feared if that did not happen, uh, there could, in fact, be a, a great civil war. Richard Norton Smith has run four presidential libraries, the Hoover, the Eisenhower, the Reagan, and now currently runs the Ford Library and Museum. It's based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The library is based in Ann Arbor. Jim Reese 
runs this place. He's the resident director. Good morning, Mr. Reese. Thanks for having me, Brian. Welcome back to our microphone. Where are you? I'm in uh, George Washington's study. Where in the house is that? We're on the first floor here, right near the front door. We're kind of on the opposite end of the house. This is the one place that George Washington considered his private refuge. I think as Richard mentioned, there were people coming and going here all the time. And they probably saw almost every room at Mount Vernon except this one. How many visitors do you get here a year? We get over a million visitors a year to Mount Vernon. That puts us second only to the White House in terms of historic houses in America. Who runs this place? Um, we're owned and managed by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, which is the oldest national preservation group in America, and we say the oldest national women's organization in America. What do you say to our Denver caller who was obviously black, he said he was, and and uh, irritated about uh, white people talking about George Washington, what, do you, what answer do you give him? Um, I, I think I agree with Richard 100%. I think Washington um, changed his feelings dramatically about slavery over his lifetime. I think we wish he had not owned slaves, but I think he was one of the few founding fathers who came to recognize that slavery and the United States of America could not go together. And toward the end of his life, I think if he could have changed all that himself, he would have. When somebody comes here, how long does it take for them to go on a tour? I think it takes probably, if you want to do everything at Mount Vernon, a good three hours. Um, we've added a lot of experiences over the last five or six years, including a farming site and a forest trail and a fruit garden and nursery. So it takes a pretty good while to see all 55 acres of Mount Vernon that we have today. How long have you been here? Oh, gosh, I've been here 15 years. I enjoyed every minute of it. Logan Sport, Indiana, call. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Brian. Morning. Thank you so much for this series on our presidents. I am thrilled to be watching this. And uh, George Washington is one of my very favorites. I am so thankful whenever I'm thinking of our country to know that we were blessed to have his leadership in the very beginning of our country and to know that he could have been made a king, but he refused that himself. And um, I recall from another program I saw that he tried to enlist uh, twice in the British Army. And I think, oh mercy, what would have happened to us if he had been um, inducted into the British Army? And also I have a question, please. I seem to recall that in one skirmish, he came through it with... Uh, two or three bullet holes in his coat. Uh, could you elaborate on that? How many bullet holes and at that time when his life was spared and which skirmish that was, please? Thank Jim you Reese, so can you much. That? Was, Thank that, you. That was in the very early years of the French Union War. Washington was only 23 and he ended the battle leading the troops, in fact, and he had four bullet holes in his coat and he was on his third horse. And even in defeat, Washington was a pretty sensational hero. He, he had a, a, a wonderful line, which also is something you would expect to hear from a 23-year-old. He, he made the comment that there is something charming about the, the sound of the bullets whistling. And King George II, no less, uh, was informed of this. He read about this in the London press, and he said he couldn't have heard many bullets if he found the sound charming. If you've just joined us, this is the first stop of 41 we're going to make. There are 41 men who have been president of the United States. And for the next 41 weeks, we will devote two, three hours each week. It will be entirely repeated, uh, or repeated in its entirety on Friday nights at 8 o'clock for those who miss it. That's East Coast time, uh, either on Mondays or Fridays. And uh, Jim Reese and Richard Norton Smith are here throughout the morning to help us better understand George Washington. Can you take us on a quick tour around the office where you are right now, Mr. Reese? Sure, Brian. Um, before we do that, I might answer the question about where our traveling show is going oh, next. Good. Um, it does, in fact, open at the Huntington Museum in San Marino, California today. It's there for about three months and then goes to the Virginia Historical Society in Richmond, then uh, around July 1st and then it goes to the Atlanta History Center um, in October and closes at the Chicago Historical Society in early 2000. And we're doing all this through the generosity of the Ford Motor Company that's helped us take the teeth and, and all sorts of wonderful things on the road. 
Hold your tour for a second. I want to get a call from Los Angeles. Folks are waiting out there. Los Angeles, you're on the line. Go ahead, please. Hi. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, thank you for the topic. It's good timing for me and my family as we're taking our our first trip out there in a couple of weeks and have every intention of uh, visiting Mount Vernon and appreciate the tour insights. Two part question for you. First of all. Uh, do you have any off the beaten path things that you would suggest us make arrangements ahead of time to see something that would be uh, off the traditional uh, brochure packet, if you will? And then, secondly, could you make a comment or two on uh, President Washington's uh, spiritual side, the religious convictions and, and things that uh, we tend to see a bit of controversy about in in terms of his personal life as well as the uh, foundation that he expected that? to uh, set into the nation, if you will. Thanks. Let me show you some videotape that uh, Mark Farkas had taken a couple of days ago at Pope's Creek, a place that a lot of people don't visit, and uh, asked Richard Norton Smith, what's this? Well, this is uh, the site of Washington's birthplace. Um, now, the house that stands there is, in fact, a reconstruction. And there is uh, some debate over just how authentic a reconstruction it is. Um, Washington's father is buried near here, Augustine, who died when uh, George was 11. You know, most of us think of Washington as a sort of natural-born aristocrat. And you can drive to this place from Washington. You can indeed. And that's uh, actually a, a little, uh, Pope's Creek is uh, uh, attached, there is an offshoot from the Potomac River. That's right. And th this site is uh, operated by the National Park Service. This is the exact site where they think the, right, on your screen, where they think the house was that's actually right. built. That's right. Do you have a suggestion, uh, Jim Reese, of an offbeat place that somebody might know about? Well, I think you should plan to spend at least three or four hours here so that you can do the slave life tour, the gardens and ground tours, the forest trail, and all the things we've got here that are pretty special. But what's so exciting is that within just a couple of hours here, there are a lot of other George Washington related sites, such as Woodlawn Plantation, which is just three miles down the road that belonged to Nellie Custis, his uh, step-granddaughter. A few miles beyond that is Kenmore Plantation, which belonged to his sister, a sensationally beautiful home. With that is Ferry Farm, uh, the boyhood home of George Washington. You could almost continue down to Williamsburg and Jamestown and spend a week in Virginia seeing places related to George Washington. Remember that eight of our presidents were born in Virginia, so there's a lot here in the state. Uh, Jim Reese, so we can move on this program. I want you to give us a brief tour. We'll let you go, and then we'll continue phones and come back to you in a few moments. Go ahead and give us a tour. Um, well, where we are right now is the study of George Washington. As I was mentioning, it was his private room. Of all the guests, probably very few of them entered this room. He would get up in the morning between 4.30 and 5.30, pop right down here. He'd shave at the table over there. He had closets here where he would dress. He'd often work till about 7 o'clock in the morning when he was joined by all the guests for breakfast. Um, one of the things that Washington was very sensitive about was that he was one of the few founding fathers who did not go to a university. So I th think that learning was very, very important to him, maybe even more important to him than those who did go to a university. You see in this room a, a wonderful array of his, his eight to nine hundred books that he had in his library. Washington loved to read and read about all sorts of things, a lot of books related to farming but also classics like Don Quixote and other great things like that. Um, Washington also, you see, would have stacks and stacks of, of papers and surveys. Many Americans know that his very first job um, at the age of 15 was that of a surveyor. In fact, he surveyed by the time he was 20 almost 60,000 acres of the Western territories. And he was very, very good at that. He had a great eye for design good mathematical skills. So what you're seeing are all the surveys of Washington. By the end of his life, he was a huge landholder. We know that he owned 70,000 acres of land in what would today be um, seven or eight different states. So what you're seeing is the feeling of Washington having a room where it didn't need to be neat and tidy. It was probably a little bit messy where he tried to manage this very, very busy life. Jim Reese, thanks, because um, we've got so much to see. We're going to keep moving. we got a call okay. for Richard Norton Smith from Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Good morning. What would you like to talk about? Mr. Smith, uh, thanks for taking my call. I had the opportunity to read your book a few years back. Uh, I've read Southall Freeman. I've read Flexner, and yours was a, a nice little critique in a certain period of his life. Oh, thank you. I, I do uh, 
verbal presentation to school children and civic groups and that sort of thing on Washington. And the point that I usually try to make is, uh, in a very simple statement, Washington was there. Um, he started the French and Indian War. He was with, spent a lot of time with the governor in Williamsburg. Perhaps he literally died in his arms. He was at the Constitutional Convention. He was obviously at his own inauguration, but he was there when the torch was passed to Adams. And although he isn't as much of a dynamic figure as Jefferson was, he seemed to be the glue that kept the whole thing constant. If you'll elaborate on that, but let me just follow up on a on a slavery comment the gentleman made earlier. I've been reading Mr. Hirschfeld's book. Uh, that, as a matter of fact, I bought there at the bookstore at Mount Vernon, and uh, it gives it gives pretty uh, pretty interesting insight in regards to his relationship with his particular slaves, and not only that, but slavery in general. As much of a student of Washington as I am, uh, I was even taken back at his stance on on uh, on slavery. I was a little surprised that he had the strong feelings that he did about slavery. But on the other hand, uh, his the fact that he owned all these slaves almost ruined him financially. At the end of his life, I'll make a quick comment and I'll leave here. At the end of his life, he kept the young, he kept the infirmed, and he kept the elderly to his financial deficit. So he realized that he was, in fact, Patriarch, not only to everyone in this country, but to those 300 plus slaves that he had there at, at Mount Vernon. If you want to elaborate on that, and thanks again for taking the call, Mr. Smith. Yeah, I think people overlook uh, the the element of sacrifice uh, throughout Washington's career. And again, you know, as a young man, very conventional ambitions. He wanted to be rich. He wanted to be famous. He wanted to be part of the uh, colonial gentry. Uh, he achieved all those things, but he outgrew them. And over time his life becomes not a parable of success as most people measure it even today, but one of sacrifice. Uh, he lost half his net worth during the revolution. Um, one thing people don't realize uh, is as commanding general with a Congress that was unreliable, to put it mildly, among other things, Washington was putting the bill out of his own pocket for all military intelligence. It's as if Colin Powell was paying for the CIA during the Gulf War, or Dwight Eisenhower uh, during World War II. Um, the other thing about Washington, and, and he never stopped growing. He never lost his curiosity. You know, most of us at some point become jaded. Uh, Oscar Wilde had that wonderful line, you know you're middle-aged when everyone you meet reminds you of someone you already know. Washington, in that sense, never grew old. He traveled more widely through this country than any of his contemporaries. He met a wider range of people. He was surprisingly accessible, certainly by modern standards. Uh, as president of New York, he had a weekly reception, Tuesday afternoon. Anyone could walk in off the street into the president's mansion um, for punch. Uh, he didn't shake hands. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was the first president who did something that democratic. We looked at the Pope's Creek um, place where he was born. And where were the other major places in his life? And I'm thinking of, you know, the New York, Philadelphia thing, and Valley Forge, and how did they fit in? Uh, well, of course, well, Fredericksburg, uh, his boyhood, although he got away from there as quickly as he could. Fifty miles south of here. That's right. Uh, Ferry Farm. And, um, and he came here. He spent, actually, he spent a lot of his time, again, his half-brother Lawrence is a very important figure in George's life. Lawrence was a more polished figure. Lawrence was a soldier. This estate is named Mount Vernon for Admiral Edward Vernon with whom uh, Lawrence had served on a military expedition in the Caribbean. Uh, he accompanied Lawrence the only time he ever left the United States. They went to Barbados together in 1751. Lawrence had contracted tuberculosis. And George, while there, contracted smallpox, which in turn turned out to be a blessing in disguise because it, in effect, inoculated him against the disease later. Lawrence died. Um, his wife, Lawrence's wife, remarried their infant daughter died, and so in 1754, at the ripe age of 22, George Washington comes into possession of 2,100 acres surrounding a one-and-a-half-story house. Over the next 45 years, he will expand that to 8,000 acres, and of course the house is transformed. He was, his first inaugural was given where? First inaugural was in New York. Second inaugural? Second inaugural was in Philadelphia. The second inaugural address, by the way, is the shortest speech perhaps ever given by a president. 126 words. Bluffton, Indiana, you're next for Richard Norton Smith. Good morning. Good morning. Based on everything I've read about John Adams, 
I'm finding it hard to understand how George Washington and John Adams ever got along on a personal level. And could you tell us more about their relationship and how George Washington selected him to be his vice president? What you see on the screen, by the way, is a view of Mount Vernon with our camera persons back to the Potomac River. So if you were going down the Potomac or flying down, landing at National, you would see this in, as... In fact, hold that view for just a moment because on an inclement day like this, normally, as Jim said, Washington would be up, he'd have breakfast at 7 o'clock. Then he would leave for a 20-mile inspection tour every day of his five farms, 8,000 acres. On a day when the weather made that impossible, a day like today, Washington would have exercised on that 96 foot long veranda, pacing nervously up and down, up and down. John Adams. John Adams. Well, you know, Adams and Washington had a, a somewhat um, difficult, occasionally rocky relationship. It's never been easy, you know, to be vice president. And can you imagine being vice president to George Washington? This godlike figure who towers over you in every sense of the word. Uh, uh, Adams uh, took credit uh, for nominating Washington. Uh, at the Continental Congress to be a uh, commanding officer. Adams, a shrewd politician, understood that you needed a Virginian to command a New England army. Um, they worked well together, for the most part, during the war. Uh, they certainly agreed after the war, politically, about the need for a constitution to replace the Articles of Confederation, for a reasonably strong central government to unite these states uh, together. So they were politically like-minded. What was the difference in their size? Well, Adams was about 5'6", uh, rather squat figure, not particularly prepossessing. He once uh, said, and he could barely contain his envy, he, he, he said that all Virginian geese are swans, which was both personal and geographical envy uh, directed toward Washington. In, in moments of real peak, he occasionally referred to Washington as old mutton head. He also said he was ignorant. Woodville, Ohio, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, I haven't heard anything about Washington's sense of humor. And certainly for a man to survive as long as he didn't go through his problems, he must have had a, a sense of humor or something. Did they tell jokes or what happened there? Thanks. He had a sense of humor. He had a sense of the ridiculous. He, uh, Interestingly enough, um, he liked to puncture pomposity. Jefferson uh, and Madison both uh, left accounts saying that he enjoyed jokes more than he told them. There is a story told about uh, during the Revolution one night, he and his fellow officers were sitting around having dinner, and the fire flared up, and Washington moved, and one of the uh, younger officers said rather cheekily that it behooved a general to stand fire, and Washington said it was worse for a general to take it from the rear. Tacoma, Washington. You're next with Richard Norton Smith. We're at Mount Vernon, 15 miles south of Washington. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, at one time when I was uh, teaching the younger children, I came across a book that had a letter from Phyllis Wheatley, a, an educated slave girl from uh, the East, wh who wrote a letter to George Washington and then received, and there was a copy of a letter, as I recall, from George Washington back to the slave girl. And she was educated and then later became a pretty famous poet. And I just wondered if any records of that are on display at Mount Vernon. In fact, it's a, it's a great story because uh, Washington loved poetry. He wrote not very good poetry as a young man, uh, and he enjoyed it all his life. And in fact, at one point uh, during the Revolution, he invited Phyllis Wheatley to come and give a recital of her poems to his fellow officers. Pretty remarkable scene. Gladys Tansel is a Mount Vernon historical interpreter, and she's a descendant of a Mount Vernon slave. Hello, Gladys Tansel, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How does it work? Where, where, how long ago was there a slave in your family? My grandfather was the slave for the John Stunt family, and uh, he demanded his freedom about 1866. Why do you act as a historical interpreter here at Mount Vernon? I act as a historical interpreter here at Mount Vernon because I like the place and my mother worked here and I enjoyed the people I worked with and I've been here almost 24 years minus 17 days. What do you say to someone like our, it sounded, I don't want to overinterpret it, an angry black man who called from Denver who didn't think that white people should be sitting and talking about uh, George Washington in such a positive way? I ignore some people. Some people are not as well educated with the times. 
and I just deal with them and deal with the situation I have it on hand. Well, what do you say though about the fact that George Washington owned slaves? How important was it to him at the time? How did he treat the slaves? Well, George Washington was an average slaveholder. I verified this by attending a seminar up in New York at the Historical Society. And to verify what I tell people as his being an average slaveholder, I received the same answer up there. I was told he was a military person and he was very strict. And he treated his slaves like all the others. I don't think he was any worse. He had some good points. He didn't sell the break up families. He didn't enforce the sick ones to work. He buried them in a coffin. He wasn't so bad. Where are you right now? Right now I'm sitting in the slave quarters. A reproduction of the slave quarters would be called the greenhouse quarters on the north lane here at Mount Vernon. How well did the slaves live in a room like that where you are? I don't think they were very happy. They couldn't have been very comfortable because the floor was cold, wet, damp, and, and dirt. But uh, somehow they survived. Our people are strong, and so they must have survived. When was the last time there was a slave in this country? Do you know? Mount Vernon ended slavery in 1834. What did they, what That's happened? That's all that concerns me right now, Mount Vernon. What happened to the slaves after they were freed? John Washington was very kind to his slaves, the ones he owned. However, uh, all of the 316 slaves were not owned by. Uh, personally owned by John Washington. Mrs. Washington had 153 of those people. John Washington freed the 123 that he had and he provided for them in their old age and he was interested in the children being educated, I understand. Where are you from originally? I was born in Washington, D.C. because Fairfax County did not give black children a high school and my mother wanted me to have an education. She was, an ed she was a, a resident of Washington, D.C. So I was born on the 31st day of January 1921 at Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, D.C. I've lived in Virginia all my life. And did you go to college? I went to Minus Teachers College one year and to um, Northern Virginia College. That's how I got this position because I was taking catering. I was going to become a caterist and going in business for myself. But Mount Vernon gave me a job with a steady income and so I decided after I finished the course that I didn't need that, but however, I enjoyed being there and I enjoyed being here. What kind of questions do you often get from people coming through here? Well, the, the common question in the house is, where are the bathrooms? And my answer to that is, I went to high school and I've been out of high school 61 years and we did not have a computer. George Washington did not have a bathroom and we existed very well and so did he. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. We're going to take some calls, this time from Ocean Township, New Jersey. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, thank you for taking my call. I was wondering if uh, Mr. Smith uh, could uh, expound a little on the relationship between uh, himself, uh, Mr. Washington uh, and uh, Thomas Paine, where he praised them early on and then left them in a prison uh, to more or less rot in France. I was wondering if he could make some comments. Uh, yeah, it was a... Uh it was certainly a difficult relationship, as you suggest in the later years. Um, Paine was a real hero of the American Revolution. I mean, he, um, uh, of course, the author of Common Sense. Um, he was a great propagandist. Washington ordered uh, that uh, Paine's works be, be read widely uh, throughout the, uh, the Continental Army. Um, it was like winning a battle in, in many ways when that army needed all the encouragement it could get. Um, later on, they had a falling out, I guess you could say. Um, I think there are two sides to the story. I think Paine uh, resented Washington politically and, and in some ways personally. Uh, Paine, of course, became a great friend of the French Revolution, uh, even after it had uh, veered uh, into its violent phase uh, with the death of uh, King Louis XIV. And uh, Washington was in a difficult position. Uh, as president, he had to, in effect, make certain that this country stayed out of Europe's wars. This was a very weak country. Uh, his whole presidency in some ways was an exercise in buying time. If you could stay out of Europe's quarrels for 20 or 30 years, he believed that the United States would naturally develop to the point where it, it literally could uh, stand on its own. And so he was precluded in some ways from following what may have been his natural inclinations. 
Uh, there's no doubt that he felt grateful to the French uh, for their assistance, but remember, it had been King Louis's government that had provided that assistance, and now the revolution that Paine supported so warmly uh, had um, committed regicide. When you wrote your book, Patriarch, about George Washington, how much time did you spend here, you know, total? In Mount Vernon? Yeah. Gosh, I came here two or three times. Not, not, a, not a lot of time. Where I did spent you... some time in Philadelphia, some time in New York, uh, but mostly that wonderful collection that the lady mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, still emerging roughly 100 volumes that are being of Washington's correspondence, which is distinctive in that it is not only all of Washington's letters, but all of the correspondence to Washington. So you get both sides. It's a wonderful, wonderful research. Tool. And you wrote a book on Thomas Dewey, a book on Harvard, a book yeah, on Herbert were, Hoover. Yeah, those were different. Those were books that required a year or two physically pulling up stakes, going to one place and immersing yourself in a huge archival collection. A and then a book on Colonel McCormick, who uh, right. had the Chicago Treatment. Of all those books, did the how did the Patriarch do compared to the rest of them? Patriarch did better than, than any of the others. It still sells? It still sells, yeah. It was a book of the month called Main Selection, and it still sells. Mill Valley, California, good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Smith. Uh, I'm a first-time caller, believe it or not. I'm happy to get in touch with you. I'm trying to... Uh, I want your opinion on uh, your reference in your book, The Patriarch, on page 375, in reference to the British publication uh, that you refer to in there about Washington's relationship with uh, Katie's daughter. Would you comment on that and find out if you've had other people who have found that, uh, that same source uh, possibly viable? Let me ask you, caller, though, you've, you've worked on this, you've looked at this book, you've got a precise question. What led your interest to all this? Uh, because of interest uh, is that when I was six years old, uh, my uh, aunt of mine uh, told us that we were descendants of George Washington on my mother's side of the family. And have you found that you are, or, or do you know yet? Uh, it's going to be impossible, I guess, without a DNA test to, to verify this, but uh, uh, I did have a chance to talk to Mr. Smith once on the phone within the last month. I called him at, uh, at his, uh, where he works about this, and uh, I have a, uh, my mother's sister and George look like identical twins. Okay, thank you very much. It's intriguing. I tell you, this, this is a real reader because that's a footnote uh, that he's referring to. It's not in the main body of the text. Uh, in fact, I think it's widely regarded as wartime propaganda that was put out by the British side. These are a couple of London uh, publications uh, in 1776 that contain these, uh, these stories about Washington uh, uh, and his sexual infidelity. Richard Norton Smith is kicking off our series about presidents, American presidents at C-SPAN and he'll be with us for the next hour and 10 minutes at a minimum. Maybe be here a little longer than that, depending on how long it goes this morning, how interested you are. And uh, we also have Jim Reese, who is the resident director of this facility. We're gonna go back to him in just a moment. We've got some video of the slaves grave site here in Mount Vernon, which is not too far from where we are. And we're gonna ask Jim Reese in a few moments. I know they changed a plaque there a number of years ago. It went from uh, referring to a slave as a black to an Afro-American. We'll find out what that's all about. A lot of snow on the ground in this March. It's snowing today, unusual for this time of year. And you can see there in memory of the Afro-Americans who served as slaves at Mount Vernon, this monument uh, marking their burial ground dedicated September 21st, 1983. And we'll try to find out in a moment uh, why that happened. We also want to show you the the work history of George Washington and what he did in his life and many different jobs that he had. Can you remember the very first job he ever had in government? In government? Well, he was a, an appointee of the government, I suppose. He was with the Virginia militia uh, in his early 20s. Uh, before that, he had been hired literally at the age of 16 to help survey uh, Alexandria. We can see there from 759 He went to, to the Bur House of Burgesses. He was, by the way, defeated the first time he ran for the House of Burgesses. Uh, legend has it because he would not uh, provide sufficient uh, liquid refreshment to the voters. How old would he have been at the first and second Continental Congresses? And where did they meet? They met in Philadelphia, and he would have been 42, uh, 42, 43 at that time. You also have to remember one thing hanging over Washington all his life. He was very cognizant of the fact that he came from a short-lived family. Um, 
His father died relatively young. Uh, males in the Washington family did not often live beyond 50. Let's go to Dunedin, Florida next. Good morning. Well, good morning. I had two points. One, I wanted to respond to your question last Friday where you were ta talking about, well, how will you measure the, when you talk to the historians about each of the presidents, how will you deal with the bias? And I had uh, thought it would be great to come up with a 10-point initiative or create criteria scale where you could list 10 points. Um, I, of course, I came up with 10 points, but I think as experts you can come up with your own 10 points and then measure each president against those uh, the same scale. And interestingly enough, you're talking about the uh, president, uh, Washington, and you said he had Auburn here, and I'm sitting here absolutely dumbfounded because I have two pictures in my living room that are old, old oil painting antiques, and now I'm totally curious that they're probably pictures of George Washington and Martha Washington. So now I'm going to have to undo them and check them out, <laughs> and I'll hang up for your comments. <laughs> I think that's the Antiques Roadshow. That's another program. How do you check, I mean, you're a historian, but how do you check yourself or other historians about bias in something like George Washington or any of the 41 presidents? It's curious. You, you cultivate a trait that Washington had, which is you're passionate about your work and you're as dispassionate as possible about how you approach your work. Um, Washington said something that I think is extraordinarily revealing and perhaps even has some contemporary significance. Uh, he told um, a young niece who was about to get married that nothing is more certain than that our experiences fall short of our expectations and to nothing does this apply more than the gratification of our passions. Now, that tells you something about what was missing in Washington's life. Uh, I've, I've often described his marriage to Martha as love without passion and yet it was that very detachment some people think coldness uh, that made Washington able to uh, withstand the passions of his time. People, people forget the 1790s were an extraordinarily controversial period in this history. We've made Washington uh, into an icon, and yet he was at the heart of constant controversy. He was a subject to some savage attacks in the press. He was called a betrayer of the revolution, the dupe of King George. Uh, he was humiliated when it was revealed that he had overspent his official salary on expenses of public entertaining. Uh, and yet he never complained, never in public. Privately, he railed against editors who he said were guilty of stuffing their publications with scurrility and nonsensical declamation. What's the best historical experience you've ever had? And I ask that in the context that when you when I interviewed you for Book Notes, you told us in the interview that you'd been to all the grave sites, which has now led to me doing that and being the laughing stock of my colleagues. But anyway, I mean, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount by going to the grave sites. It, in your life, though, what has worked the best? You know, curiously, I'm, I'm so fortunate because I get to work with people who are making history. You know, when I was in D.C., I was a speechwriter, worked with Bob and Elizabeth Dole. I uh, more recently worked with President Reagan, with President Ford. I mean, that's an extraordinary education. And it gives you, hopefully, some insights into the governing process, which, although it certainly has changed over 200 years, has some elements that, uh, that are enduring. One of the reasons we're doing this series, of course, is for educators and students. And we have an organization called C-SPAN in the Classroom, run by Joanne Wheeler. She and her staff are available to talk to you about all this. The website, you can access. I don't, for some reason or other, on all my material here, I have the telephone number to call, and I need, uh, I need that phone number. It's a 202 number. I can give you the main number, but we have a 626 number that I need to give our audience, and I don't know, what, there we are, on the screen. It's an 800 number that you can call, 1-800-523-7586. And that's some of our promotional materials there on the right. All of this is free of charge to you if you want to get involved. And then you have cspan.org slice classroom, there will be teacher's guides and lesson plans. As we go through the year, there will be a poster available to you later on that you can use. And we figured that all of this material will be on videotape and ready for call up in the future for those of you who want to use it to teach in the classroom. Next call from Crowley, Texas. Go ahead, please. Excuse me, did uh, George Washington actually chop down that Jerry tree? <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. That's how old what are I'm you? asking. How old are you? How old are you? Twelve and a half. Twelve and a half. Has somebody told you at some point in your life that he chopped down the cherry tree? 
Um, no, I read it in the book that he might have, but I don't know if he did or not. What does it mean to you that he did chop down the cherry tree? Um, that he would have <laughs> lied about it. Thank you for your call. Who was the call from? Crowley, Texas. You have a minute for a story? Sure. John Conway, great Texan, used to tell the story about uh, George Washington being a Texan. And as everyone in the audience kind of woke to gasp, he explained that as a young man, George Washington went out with a hatchet and he cut down the family's mesquite tree. And his father learned of this. He summoned him and said, George, did you cut down the mesquite tree? He said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. I did cut down the mesquite tree. At which point his father said, pack your bags, George. We're moving to Washington, D.C. And he said, why? Because I uh, cut down the mesquite tree? And he said, no, because if you can't tell a lie, you'll never succeed in Texas. Um, the story uh, comes from Parson Weems, who was Washington's earliest and most sugary biographer, really hagiographer. And in some ways, unfortunately, Washington's paid a price ever since because we're still reacting. We live in a, some would say ironic, some would say cynical age that is uncomfortable with heroics and certainly suspicious of anything that smacks of perfection. There is another, of course, popular Washington story. Remember that of the uh, Washington throwing the dollar across uh, the Rappahannock. That is easily disproved because uh, no one was less likely to throw money away than George Washington. He was a true fiscal conservative. He used to say, many mickles make a muckle. We have some video of Ferry Farm. What is that? Ferry Farm is, in fact, uh, Washington's boyhood home uh, in uh, just outside Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, ferry, in fact, there was a ferry that uh, took folks across the, uh, the river there uh, to uh, Fredericksburg. This site has uh, actually been the recently purchased, I believe, by the Kenmore folks. Um, it will be uh, preserved and uh, probably undergo some restoration. Uh, this was the home that Washington probably can be said to be happiest to have escaped. Uh, he left behind his mother, a rather vinegary uh, character, Mary Ball Washington. And um, remember his father, Augustine, had died at 11. Um, and he was very eager to leave Ferry Farm and spend as much time as possible with Lawrence here at Mount Vernon. Where are we? You can see on the screen we're in a room full of yeah, yes, we are paintings. In, yes, we're in the, uh, uh, the walnut uh, room. This is a, sort of a gaming room almost. Um, this would have been part of the original house. Actually, this would have, uh, let's, let's back up a bit because the original house dates to 1735, eight rooms. Washington modified this house twice. Once before he married Martha, he took a one and a half story house, he turned it into a two and a half story house, and this room, uh, the Walnut Parlor, would almost have certainly been created at that time, the late 1750s. We have eight cameras here, as we said today. Let's take a look around and see what those eight cameras are up to at the moment. Cameras outside on a rainy, snowy, cold, somewhat dreary day, but folks are here. Buses are here. Sure. People are touring through this Mount Vernon residence. Total, go ahead. I'll be about a million a year, uh, yeah, and no doubt reset. many more this year because of the bicentennial. Again, I'm struck with the, the coincidence. This is a day very much like the day in December of 1799 when Washington, uh, instead of exercising on the piazza, uh, uh, spent a great deal of time outdoors, uh, came back with his hair matted with uh, snow and ice, and uh, the rest, as I say, is history. Next week, we'll be at the Adams residence in Quincy, Massachusetts, about 20 minutes outside of Boston, where both John Quincy Adams and John Adams were born. We'll be there for the father, John Adams, and our guest will be David McCullough during the program. The following week, Annette Gordon-Reed will be our principal guest, and we'll be at Monticello for the Jefferson stop. As we say, this is 41 men, 41 presidencies, actually 42 presidencies, and uh, we'll be doing this until December the 20th, which is our last stop, and that's the Bill Clinton stop. Some of you might have seen last week that he was back to his original birthplace home on, I think it's Hervey Street there in Hope, Arkansas. The next call, by the way, is from, before we take it, it's from Fairfax, Virginia. That just obviously triggers a question. Sure. Fairfax. Uh, Lord Fairfax, the Fairfax family. Uh, remember, it was Washington's great-grandfather who originally owned this property. That goes back to the 1670s. And they received, in fact, about a 5,000-acre grant, uh, and they became quite close to the Fairfaxes. 
Sally Fairfax, that story? Sally Fairfax was the wife of Washington's best friend, uh, George William Fairfax, who in fact supervised some of that reconstruction of this house while uh, George was off uh, on the frontier uh, fighting with uh, British regulars. Um, the Fairfaxes uh, lived at Belvoir, which is an estate no longer stands, a few miles down the river. Is that where they get the name Fort Belvoir? I believe so. And they left, a very poignant, uh, they made the choice when the revolution broke out that they would go home to England. But and was Washington there, what was the personal relationship between George Washington and Sally Fairfax? It is a subject of continuing speculation. I think it's safe to say that Washington was uh, somewhat infatuated, perhaps in love, with Sally Fairfax. Um, she was um, a woman who represented sophistication, uh, worldliness, cultural refinement, and this was a young man who was on the make and who above all wanted to remake himself, you know. As a teenager, he sat down and laboriously copied out 110 rules of civility, sort of the Emily Post of his day. Uh, he is the ultimate self-made American, and Sally, in effect, was part of that process. Jim Reese, the resident director of Mount Vernon, where are you now? Um, we're in the master bedroom, which is right above the study that we were in just a few minutes ago. And, and you're looking at the bed where we know that George Washington died, the exact bed. He died here on um, December 14, 1799, um, from quinsy, which was an, uh, an infection of the throat, not unlike what we would call strep throat today. Just during this special year, we're trying to give visitors the feeling of what this room would have been like during the exact moments surrounding the death of Washington. And that's why you see it looking different than it usually looks. What would be the difference between what we see now and what we would have seen a year ago? Well, you're trying to imagine that George Washington is right there in the bed. And what you see around in the room are all the things that the three doctors were trying to use to save his life. For instance, on the table over here, we have herbs and um, a lot of ingredients they were trying to mix together for poultices. They gave him enemas. Um, they bled him no less than four times, probably drained about a third to a fourth of the blood from Washington's body, which of course made him weaker and probably hurried his death instead of helping him. Why did they think at that time, uh, Richard Smith, that bleeding someone would keep him alive? It's a good question to 20th century uh, eyes, but it was certainly uh, an international custom. Uh, it was prevalent uh, uh, throughout the world. Jim Reese, uh, when I was up there just a moment ago, I looked at that bed and said that can't be big enough for George Washington to fit in it, but I gather that's not true. Oh, it, it's a very, very large bed for the period. In fact, Martha Washington ordered this bed especially for George Washington because, as Richard said, he was almost six foot three inches tall, even though she was just five feet tall. You know, I, I think that Richard is right that they may not have been um, the most fireworks-oriented in love couple when they first got married, but my belief is that they became a very loving couple, and that their personalities worked very well together, so that when George Washington was, would close this door at night, he knew he could trust and, and, and tell all, of, all that he needed to tell to his wife, Martha, and they were very, very close, I think. What was the end really like for George Washington? What well, happened at the end? Well, I, I think as he faced most other things in life, Washington was somewhat resigned that he probably would not survive um, this bout with Quincy. Um, he sent one of his servants down to get two copies of his will that he had in a lockbox. He looked at those two copies of the will and burned one of those copies. We'll never know what was in that copy of the will. Um, he allowed the three doctors to try a lot of different um, remedies to cure him but he constantly reminded them that he did not think he would survive and not to worry, not to be too concerned. And in fact, his final words, I think, were, were very revealing. His final words were, tis well. And I think Washington was in essence saying he could leave, leave the country on solid footing and that he had great faith in America's future. Anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, one of the contradictions, there are so many contradictions about Washington, which again make him so much more interesting than the icon we've been presented, is this conflict between a, a, an ambitious man, enormously ambitious, really lifelong, and someone who was a bit of a fatalist. Uh, his favorite uh, motto came from the play Cato, "'Tis not in mortals to command success," which on the surface flies in the face of everything we know about Washington's actual life. Jim Reese, what time of day did he die? 
he died at, he died at night and in, one of the things in his will was that he he did not want to be buried for three days um, apparently there was a feeling in the Washington family that they might be buried alive which we find very curious where was he buried he was buried right here at Mount Vernon um, we still have what we call the old tomb where his body was placed um, in fact after his body was placed there Martha Washington agreed to have him buried in the new Capitol building and there's still a vault that his body was supposed to go in in the Capitol building but then she died and the heirs decided that no Washington should be buried back at Mount Vernon in the exact location that he selected and a tomb was built um, around um, 1830. How many people are buried in and around that tomb where we see on our screen right now? We, we really aren't we aren't really sure. We know that the vault holds at least 20 bodies behind the, the sarcophaguses of uh, George and Martha Washington. And we think that there are a number of slaves buried in the area of the slave memorial, but we'll never know exactly how many people are buried there. We have a call from Fairfax, Virginia. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, thank you. In the library, uh, Robert Lewis, who is the nephew of George Washington and his uh, personal secretary, said that George Washington he saw on his knees in prayer and also reading the Bible. But the Bible doesn't seem to be in that library. Is there some reason for that? Jim Reese? Um, there are a lot of George Washington Bibles, and um, we have several here at Mount Vernon, some on display. I'm not exactly sure which Bible you're referring to, um, so I'm not sure I can answer that question. You know, one of the things that uh, we uh, are going to do as we go through this year is talk to a student from a high school that's named after the president that we're talking about that week. And our student this week is Austin Blakesley, who is at the George Washington Middle School in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, are you there, Mr. Blakesley? Yes. How are you this morning? Good. Why did they name your middle school there after George Washington? Do you know? Um, I'm not really sure, but I think it's because we're so close to Washington, D.C., and George Washington owned a townhouse in Alexandria, and we're right in Alexandria. Have you studied much about the first president? Um, we did in fifth grade, but not this year. How interested in history are you? I'm pretty interested. Do the other kids that you go to school with know anything about George Washington? Do you get a sense that it matters to them that the school's named after him? I don't know. It doesn't... I'm not sure. I don't really think so. I have a picture here with me on the set of the school. Can you tell us how many kids go to school at George Washington Middle School? Um, about 1,000, 1,500, I think. What is your favorite subject? Um, let's see, probably social studies or language and, arts. And you say that it was as early as your fifth grade where you learned about George Washington. Are you studying anything about American history right now? Um, yes, right now in social studies we're doing the civil rights movement. Have you studied anything about slaves? Um, some, mainly last year in the sixth grade. If you had to decide today what you wanted to do when you got older, do you have, a, do you have already in mind a, a profession that you want to be involved in? No. Do you know if you want to go to college? Yes. Where, do you know? Um, no. It's a little I... early. Unfair to ask all these questions. <laughs> How old are you? I'm 13. And what's your favorite subject in school? Um, probably language arts is my absolute favorite. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. You're welcome. We have a call waiting from Orleans, Vermont. Good morning. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Hi. Um, my husband and I were in Washington, D.C. about five or six years ago, and what really impressed me in the Capitol building was there's a portrait of uh, George Washington on bended knee, and I was curious as to his affiliation with the Episcopalian Church and how he was associated with Freemasonry. Jim Maurice, do you want to try that? Jim Reese isn't there. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah, he was an active vestryman of the Episcopal Church. Uh, there was a church uh, not far from Mount Vernon. Uh, later on, he had a pew at Christ Church in Alexandria. He attended uh, St. Paul's in New York City uh, and subsequently uh, services in Philadelphia. Over the years, there's been a good deal of uh, debate, I guess you could say, over exact, the exact nature of Washington's religious faith. He's often lumped together with some of the other founders who were deists who believe that, in effect, uh, 
uh, a higher power created the universe and then set it spinning, almost like the, the wheels of a clock. Uh, I think it's a little more personal than that. I think Washington, again, as he grew older, um, particularly in the revolution and again in the presidency, I think he came to feel a greater reliance, much as Lincoln did during his presidency, upon a, a more personal God than that. Jim Reese, what kind of a service was held for him when he died? I mean, it was primarily a Masonic service. Um, George Washington was involved in uh, Freemasonry from about age 20 until he died, and I think it was one of those things he really believed in. And um, he used the Masons to lay the cornerstone for the Capitol, and I don't think it's a bit surprising that Martha allowed the Masons to do the service when he died. What did Martha, or what was Martha Washington's reaction when her husband died? Um, I think Martha Washington, by that point, was absolutely exhausted, and she basically was resigned to follow her husband fairly soon. And in fact, later on, we'll see that she moved upstairs to a very secluded bedroom on the third floor and pulled herself out of the social life and the political life of America. Going back to the children, uh, you said earlier that George Washington himself didn't have any children. Martha Washington had how many children? She had four. Two of which died in infancy, grandchildren, and the other two uh, uh, died subsequently. Uh, and then there were the, the grandchildren. Um, Jim, how many grandchildren? Um, she, she, in uh, fact, had four grandchildren. Um, going back to the children, the daughter we think died of an epileptic seizure here at Mount Vernon, in the, the uh, family dining room. Right, and then the son, Jackie, did indeed marry fairly young, and had the four grandchildren that you see on the wall here in the master bedroom. Now, what's so sad is that Jackie stayed out of the Revolutionary War and then decided to join the victory event at Yorktown. And like many, many other brave soldiers, he died of camp fever at Yorktown. So after eight long years of war, George Washington was faced with the situation of coming home to his wife and saying, at last we've won, but my gosh, your, your last surviving child has died. And um, I think what saved her from a total depression was that the mother suggested that the two youngest grandchildren, real toddlers at that point, Nellie and Washi, move in to Mount Vernon. Now, Richard, you said that George Washington liked children. I don't know after eight years of war whether he was as thrilled as she was <laughs> that two little grandchildren moving into Mount Vernon, but I think it was a wonderful thing for the Washingtons. And those two grandchildren got to go to New York and Philadelphia and Nellie Custis in particular was almost like a little American princess. I think she had a wonderful life. How, who painted those uh, paintings in the room there and when were they painted? These are, these are pines and they're painted in the last half of the 18th century, obviously. But interestingly, Nellie Custis looks much older there than she really is. I think she's only about 12 years old in that picture. Jim Reese told us earlier he's been here for 15 years and then a million people visit Mount Vernon and he is here on behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Who are they? Um, they're the original group that purchased Mount Vernon from the Washington family for a lot of money, $200,000 in 1858. Our board includes 30 to 35 women, and what's interesting is there's no more than one per state. So those women represent uh, 30 to 35 different states from across the country. And they meet uh, many times during the year and make the major, major decisions about where Mount Vernon is going in the future. What's it cost to visit here? Um, we're, we're still one of the most um, cost-effective sites, if you will. Um, we try to keep our um, ticket price to be that uh, around the same thing as a movie ticket. So today we're $8 for an adult, and it goes down to being free if you're six years old or younger. Bellwood, Illinois, you're next. Yes, I would like to know if there's, well, was there any sexuality between George Washington and any slaves? Thank you. The question is, was there any sexual relations between George Washington and his slaves. There's absolutely no evidence of it, no contemporary accounts. Jim, you... And we, we get those questions all the time, and I can honestly say that we don't think there's any strong documentation that George Washington had a child with, with anyone. Um, in fact, some scholars believe that um, George Washington may have been rendered sterile um, from a bout of smallpox he experienced when he visited Barbados. So I, I really do believe he was a very loyal husband to Martha Washington and had so much else on his mind that that was the last thing he needed. Tallahassee, Florida, go ahead, please. 
Uh, good morning, Brian. Hi. I have a couple of uh, uh, facts about George Washington that I think the listeners will find interesting. First is that uh, George Washington's birth year changed during his lifetime, not only his birthday, but his birth year. Uh, that was because the Calendar Act of 1751, <coughs> which was adopted by Britain and affected the colonies, uh, changed the, uh, uh, adjusted the date uh, by uh, 11 days, but also it also moved New Year's Day from March 25th to January 1st. Until that time, uh, throughout the English-speaking world, New Year's Day was celebrated on March 25th. Hold on just a second. Uh, any comment from either Jim Reese or... or Reese no, and then, of course, Congress got into the act, and uh, George Washington's birthday became a, a movable feast. Clayton, California, you're next. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Yes. Uh, uh, hi, Brian. How are you doing? Hi. I love your program. Thanks. Um, I have a question about uh, Mr. Hansen. I understand that Mr. Hansen was actually the first president of the United States, although he was appointed. He was not elected. And I'm just really curious about that. Who was he? Uh, who appointed him? And uh, where did he go? Thank you. John Hansen. <laughs> Is that it's not like I think you may be of more authority on Mr. Hansen. Well, we had, well, it's the John Hansen Highway out here, Route 50, as you know, and he's buried, I think, up here in, I think, Maryland. Or I, we found him wherever. Um, have you visited his grave? I have not. No, oh, okay. I, that, you, you still have the record. Uh, you know nope. anything? Huh? Oh, don't know. Um, never heard of him. Never heard of him. But we have had that question a lot. Lately. Yeah. Yeah. Cottage Grove, Minnesota. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, I had a question and a comment. Uh, my comment is about, or actually, my question is about uh, the agricultural crops that uh, Washington grew. Uh, mainly hemp and his uh, stance as far as hemp being the uh, billion dollar crop, the saving crop in uh, for the nation and uh, whether or not uh, whether or not he was adamant, actually adamant about that and uh, my comment being uh, that Thomas Jefferson and Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was George Washington's personal physician and the signer of the Decla Declaration of Independence, uh, both foresaw that the federal government might attempt to control medicine, and that Dr. Rush warned against the warned that unless med med medicinal freedom was constitutionally guaranteed, medicine would eventually become a, an undercover dictatorship, in which the art of healing would be restricted to one of the one class of men, while equaling privileges. Uh, while equal privileges were denied to others. Thanks, Cottage Grove. Thanks. Eric Smith? Yeah, I'm afraid that question's going to go up in smoke. Uh, let me tell you about George Washington, the farmer. Here's a great example of his versatility. Uh, and again, it flies in the face of the notion of Washington as a perhaps somewhat stalwart conservative figure. Uh, Washington was a great experimental farmer. He very early concluded that tobacco uh, would not grow here, that it would exhaust the soil. And so even before the revolution, he, uh, flying in the face of conventional wisdom, replaced most of his tobacco with corn and wheat. But he didn't stop there. Um, he had as many as 60 crops in rotation that he was experimenting with. He, he uh, went so far as to dig up mud from the riverbed of the Potomac to use as a kind of natural fertilizer. He, uh, he sprinkled plaster of Paris on his front lawn and on the clover. He had a 16-sided brick burn. Um, he was a man who was in many ways ahead of his time uh, in agriculture. Uh, but I don't, I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the questioner that he saw the future of American agriculture uh, in hemp. It's uh, starting to clear up here a little bit, and we're going to be able to show you in just a moment. Uh, actually, we can show it to you now. That is the Potomac from out here in the front yard of uh, Mount Vernon, and we can swing around to show you where the house is and how it all fits in. In the old days, Jim Reese, did they take a boat down to Washington or up to Washington? I, I think that to get to the city of Washington, they may have used a boat, but boats were generally used at Mount Vernon primarily to carry materials because Washington was really quite a businessman. Richard mentioned that wheat was one of his favorite crops. 
He built just down the road on his property about a, a huge grist mill with two wheels that work simultaneously. Next to that, he built a distillery with five stills. He could operate at the same time. We know that during the last year of his life, he produced 11,000 gallons of whiskey and a lot of homemade beer. So Washington was using the river, I think, more to transport goods than he was to use it to transport people. Sun City, Arizona. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Reese, I have a question on the ladies, uh, Mount Vernon Ladies Association. We worked with them in honoring Martha Washington, and I didn't realize that there were people from 30 states who were appointed to that group. I wondered how one got appointed to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Um, the board actually picks its own new members, and um, we get people expressing interest all the time. It's generally women that have been very active in historical and garden and um, business types groups and leadership roles in their own states, and it's generally women that have lived in their states a long time. Smithfield, North Carolina, you're next. Hello, Smithfield. Uh, yes, uh, my question for Mr. Smith is, about 20 years ago, I read a book, George Washington's Expense Account, and the author, I can't remember his name at this time, but he, uh, he claimed that the President Washington initially wanted to serve without salary as president, but that the uh, Congress felt like that his expense account had been so extravagant during the Revolution of, of that they declined his offer. And I, I had some real doubts about the how authentic that was, but I wanted to hear from Mr. Smith on that. And I certainly uh, appreciate, Brian, you having the show on, on the presidents. Thanks for the call. I think the book was, uh, the, the expense account book was semi humorous. Um, <clears throat> in fact, as I indicated earlier, call may not have heard it, uh, Washington uh, uh, didn't make any money off the revolution. He uh, emerged from the revolution uh, with 50% of his net worth gone. Um, he did initially express a desire to uh, repeat the, the, uh, the process, to uh, take expenses only uh, during the presidency, not because he thought it was going to uh, enrich him, but uh, uh, because it was another example of the sacrifice uh, that he thought was uh, an important part of establishing, if you will, the credibility uh, of the new government. Uh, in the end, uh, Congress settled on a $25,000 a year salary. Um, and, in fact, Washington overspent that salary on, uh, on more than one occasion. The costs of official entertaining uh, were, were somewhat exorbitant. By the way, you might be interested to know the, uh, the other officers. Uh, there were those in Congress who wanted to pay the vice president on a per diem basis figuring that uh, the days that he actually presided over Congress, he would be paid. That was finally uh, ruled to be uh, inconsistent with the dignity of the office. Um, Thomas Jefferson, as Secretary of State, found himself presiding over five clerks with an annual budget of $8,000. Uh, his salary was $3,500. Our series, by the way, if you've just joined us, will go on throughout the rest of the year. We're calling it American President's Life Portraits, and our objective is to spend a couple of hours on a site somewhere that relates to each of the 41 men who have been president. Open the phones up and get your comments and your questions. Find some experts to come in and talk about what they know about the individual presidents. Then offer some educational materials for folks who want to use this in their classroom and get video of each of the primary locations that relate to each president. For instance, France's Tavern. France's Tavern in New York City was the location for what? either Jim Reese or Rick Smith? Well, I'll give this to Jim. This basically, Francis Tavern is, is known today. I believe this is a reconstruction of the original building. I may be wrong. Jim could, could uh, clear that up. But this is famous as the site of Washington's farewell to his uh, fellow officers at the end of the Revolution. And again, by all contemporary accounts, what happened there flies in the face of the conventional image of the stoic, uh, unemotional Washington because tears flowed and it was a very emotional parting. Uh, I believe Washington invited everyone to take him by the hand, and I think Henry Knox, who um, was his great artillery commander, later his Secretary of War, was the, uh, the first to do so. And um, it was, uh, as you might expect, men who had been through uh, some extraordinarily perilous times together. Um, it was a very emotional event. Have you been there, Jim Reese? Oh, I've been there many times. It's a wonderful place. In fact, on April 8th, I'm going up there again because they're doing a preview of a new uh, drama on George Washington they hope will end up on Broadway, so we're very excited about that. 
We, I, we have a call from outside the country, and because it costs them a lot more money than it does our local calls here, I want to go to that next if I could. I believe it's, I, is it Eitoven, the Netherlands? Yes, that's correct. Um, but I'm visiting the uh, United States right now, so it's oh, not as expensive as you suggested. Okay, well, that's fine. Where, where are you located right now? I'm in Hartsville, South Carolina. Would you mind turning down the television set so we don't get that echo, and then we'll be able to hear you a little bit better? Okay, is this better? Yes, it is. And what's your comment or question you'd like to uh, get in here? Well, the, un the Netherlands was the first state to officially recognize the United States after the uh, declaration of the independence. And I wondered in uh, what way it did boost the morale of the founding fathers by being recognized by another country. It not only boosted the morale, more important, it, uh, it filled the treasury, which was uh, practically empty. Uh, large loans from the Dutch uh, helped sustain not only the war effort, but the... Um, the post-war government, such as it was under the Articles of Confederation. So there was a very special relationship established with the Netherlands, uh, sentimental and practical. And the Dutch, who have, I think, 15 million people over there, are the third largest owners of property or corporations in this country at this time? I wouldn't be surprised. I think right behind uh, Great Britain and Japan. They've always been good business people. Alexandria, Virginia, you're next. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, in addition to um, Alexander being surveyed by Washington, I think he was a trustee of the city in its 250th anniversary this year. He was an original box owner at uh, Christ Church, and his mother told him to forget not the duty of secret prayer. In his early 20s, he wrote some twice daily prayers, and one of them said for Monday morning, which is appropriate for now, would be, direct my thoughts, words, and work daily more and more into the likeness of thy son, Jesus Christ which indicates a pretty personal relationship. Gentlemen, reaction? I think that's, again, consistent with, with my own sense, that as Washington, uh, particularly as Washington grew older and had more responsibilities in his life, I think religion uh, became increasingly important to him. Jim Reese, around the Mount Vernon facility here, there are a lot of little buildings. Um, are they, how much of this has been rebuilt? Um, we have 12 buildings that date to the 18th century, and we restored 11 of, the, of those 12. There are a few other buildings, like the Greenhouse Building, that are built on the foundation, but they are, in fact, uh, restorations. Um, but, you know, what's so special is that when Mount Vernon was purchased by the women in 1858, a lot of people wanted to tear down the outbuildings because they were related to slavery. And these women had the sense to protect every single structure at Mount Vernon, even those that were falling down from the very beginning. Jim Reese, uh, one of the things I've found in traveling around to the different sites is the incredible difference between the number of people that attend a place like Mount Vernon, you say over a million, and Millard Fillmore's home up in East Aurora, New York, which I think the last time I asked somebody there was 900 in the past year. Who do you compete with when it comes for presidential homes? Who's, do you have any, any idea who's who are the next two or three and the number of people that visit them? Well, Monticello gets probably between five and 600,000 people, and then it falls pretty quickly after that. Um, you know, I don't think we compete with them, though. You know, history is being dropped from the classroom so fast that I think, really, if you've been to one historic house and that house does a good job, you're more likely to go to another. So we work pretty closely with Monticello and Colonial Williamsburg and other historic places trying to get particularly younger generations more interested in history because we think in the long run it will help us all. Let's go next to Durango, Colorado. Go ahead, please. You're on American Presidents with C-SPAN. You're next. Good morning, gentlemen. I was just in Mount Vernon a week ago, and I'm 41 years of age, and it was the most awesome time of my life. I sat on the back porch there and looked out over the Potomac, and tried to reminisce as George Washington would have during his 45 years in residence. But my question is, why is there such a rush to rewrite history of, of America, the truth that actually came out, and why don't they teach it more in school? Uh, had I received more training, it would have meant more to me. Tell us more, though, why you think it's being rewritten. I think there's a rush to rewrite history right now due to the fact of the current political situation to make it uh, seem more like uh, if the presidents of old did uh, certain things out of uh, context as far as their uh, private life, then uh, the, the president we have now um, did the same thing, so to speak. 
Richard Smith. Yeah, you know, there's, there's nothing worse than the condescension of the present toward the past. It is an article of faith with most Americans that each generation is better, richer, fairer, stronger. We, we tend to think of our history as an escalator that carries us effortlessly upward. And so from that height, we tend to look over our shoulders and sometimes down our nose. It's terribly unfair. Uh, the fact is we have a lot we could learn from earlier generations. And above all, I think any historian will tell you, uh, if you're going to, you know, historians wake the dead. That's what we're in the business of doing. And if we're going to do that, we, let's listen to them, what they have to say for themselves. Let's experience the world that they knew. Uh, it may very well be that they have something to teach us. In about an hour and a half at 12 noon East Coast time, you can join our AmericanPresidents.org website. And Jack Warren, a historian on George Washington, will be there to answer your questions. And we'll continue this discussion. That's at noon. Only if you're watching this live. That's in about an hour and a half. And anybody that wants to get onto the site can just go to either cspan.org and it'll be linked or go to directly to AmericanPresidents.org and you can find the material that you can see there on your screen. Over on the left is a portrait of George Washington that was done for us exclusively by Chaz Fagan and he will do one of each of the presidents, 41. And as the year goes by, you'll see a lot of them and we're going to figure out somewhere or another to share his work with you as the year goes on. So. Lock on to this, especially if you're in the teaching profession. There'll be a lot available to you. And if you're a student, we hope that we can be a resource as you study. Franklin, Pennsylvania, you're watching Mount Vernon on your screen right there. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Yes, this is Lois Minnick in Franklin, Pennsylvania, Venango Hi. County. Were you named, was that town named after Benjamin Franklin? Uh, not just only after him, but he, he entered into the picture. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yes. I watch C-SPAN regularly uh, for just uh, ongoing news, hearings, and what have you, and always your special such as this. I was interested in one of your early callers who mentioned Franklin and George Washington's visit through here as a young surveyor. We had four. We have four fort sites uh, in Venango County, the only place there are four, Venango, Machault, uh, Franklin, and the old garrison. And George Washington visited here and went on to the Erie Triangle as a surveyor. We also had a Phyllis Wheatley Center with the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church from, uh, I remembered, in the mid-30s and on through for the next 10 or 15 years, and young people from uh, both the white community as well as the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, went to that Phyllis Wheatley Center uh, like an afternoon uh, uh, place to stop after schools. And I just thought I would like to uh, turn, uh, share that with you. And I've already visited with a former uh, young person I had as a Y teen in the YMS, YWCA program. She's now a newspaper person, and she's going to run some things on this series, which I understand will go on through to December 20th. I expect to catch them in Franklin, Pennsylvania, and in my summer home in Chautauqua, New York. Thank you very much for this. Thanks for calling. Anything you want to comment on? Well, Pennsylvania was sort of a second home to Washington, not only, of course, because of Philadelphia. <clears throat> uh, there was a somewhat less happy uh, visit that Washington made tour of the state uh, during his second term as president. Something called the Whiskey Rebellion broke out. Um, farmers in particular in the western part of the state who didn't want to pay an excise tax imposed by the federal government. And uh, violence was threatened. And Washington did something that fortunately no other president has ever had to do. He put on his military uniform, he climbed on a, uh, a charger, and he led an army of 16,000 militia out of Philadelphia uh, into the Pennsylvania backwoods to put down the rebellion. How long would it take someone to ride a horse between here and Philadelphia? Here in Philadelphia? Hmm, gosh, good question. Probably do it in three or four days. How about... Washington, you know, uh, it, Washington traveled very extensively as president. And he went, he actually took a three-month tour of the South during his first term. And he was very choreographed tours, not unlike a presidential visit today. He would cover 40 or 50 miles a day in a coach. And when he came to the outskirts of a town, he would get out of the coach, he would climb on this enormous charger, white charger called Prescott, and ride into town. Uh, which was a site, of course, that people never forgot. We have some video of Federal Hall, which is located up near Wall Street, or right at Wall Street, and that's the site of the first inaugural. 
Anything? Yeah, this is actually a bit of a misnomer because this is the site of Federal Hall. The structure you see here actually dates to, I believe, 1842. It was a sub-treasury building. Federal Hall was originally New York City's City Hall. It was built in 1703, uh, the site of the John Peter Zenger Freedom of the Press trial in the 1720s. Later, the Stamp Act Congress met there. Uh, when it was decided that the, uh, the government would be in New York, uh, a lottery was held. And Pierre Charles L'Enfant, famed as the uh, uh, designer of Washington, D.C., remodeled the city hall to serve as a seat of national government. Uh, it was only there for about a year and a half. It then moved to Philadelphia. Uh, subsequently, Federal Hall fell into disrepair, and it was torn down early in the 19th century. So the structure you see there, Federal Hall National Memorial, is its replacement. Our guest runs the Ford Museum and Library in Grand Rapids in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He did run Eisenhower's, the Eisenhower Library, and that's out in, in uh, Abilene, Kansas. He ran the Reagan Library, which is up in Simi Valley, right outside of Los Angeles in California. How many years were you there? Uh, about two and a half. And the Hoover Library, which is in West Branch, Iowa, where Herbert Hoover and his wife is buried. How long were you there? About six years. And what years? Oh gosh, uh, 87 to 93, but I did double duty at the Eisenhower Centennial in 1990. San Diego, California, our next caller. Go ahead, please. Brian, Mr. Smith, uh, President Washington was a uh, noted free and accepted Mason. Would you comment on his personal Masonic history and how he felt Masonry uh, dealt with the American uh, emergence as a world power and also our governmental affairs. I'll hang up and listen to your comments. Caller, let me ask you, are you a Mason? Yes, sir, I am. I am what, is it, what does it mean to be a Mason today? Uh, honor, integrity, uh, dealing with all men on the square. Thanks. I think those are qualities that one associates throughout the history of Masonry and so, uh, with, with Washington's uh, membership. You are looking right now, as a matter of fact, at a picture of the George Washington National Masonic Memorial, which is in Alexander, Virginia, very impressive structure, uh, which houses um, a number of Washington artifacts and um, in fact a, as I recall, a spectacular statue, uh, standing statue of Washington. That uh, structure was dedicated in 1932. Um, Herbert Hoover dedicated it. He was very angry, by the way, that he had to leave uh, the White House in the middle of the Depression to go and dedicate uh, and cut a ribbon, as he said. But uh, it's a magnificent structure and a very fitting memorial to Washington and to the Masonic movement. Those of you who have never been to Washington, if you fly here and land at what is now called Reagan National Airport and you come up from the south and land, you actually off to the left, you'll see that Masonic temple. At night you can see it, it's lighted. But also if you go to Washington DC and then come back to Mount Vernon, you literally go inside Washington and then drive all the way back through the city of Alexandria, Virginia. It's about a 15 mile drive out here along the Potomac River where Mount Vernon is located. And as Jim Reese told us earlier, it costs you $8 to get in here if you're just coming for one visit and he suggests as much as three hours to be set aside if you want a tour and then 50 miles south an important city in George Washington's life is Fredericksburg there our next caller on the line go ahead please you're on the air uh, good morning Brian thank you Hi. so very much for this series this is going to be so wonderful uh, I have lived in Fredericksburg for a little while and there is so much history in the Fredericksburg area I just wanted to call in because the earlier caller who uh, is interested in, in presidential history would really want to see Fredericksburg. Right in the city itself, we have the, um, the home of Mary Washington, uh, President Washington's mother. She lived and died there and is buried in this town. Uh, he visited there many times. We've also got uh, the Rising Sun Tavern, a tavern that George Washington was there, uh, visited many times along with other important Americans. Um, we also have um, the apothecary shop right in town that's fascinating uh talking about the uh the uh blood sucker the the that would 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 take the blood out and in the different methods of of medicine uh that they had at that period it's fascinating not only for adults but wonderful for children to attend some of these these uh buildings and, and sites that we have in this area have you gone to the james monroe 
law offices there. Have, have gone there. That is, that's another fascinating place to visit. I think that's where we're going to go for the James Monroe. I can't remember for sure, but uh, his week in just a couple of weeks, I think, is there. And our, our um, let me just see. Yeah, it is from the Monroe Museum, according to our producer, Mark Parkins. It probably is because you've even been down here before at the very same museum. I you saw bet. the crew there one other time. But uh, the battlefields in the area are fascinating. Of course, the uh, boyhood home of, of George Washington at Ferry Farm and at Pope's Creek. Um, the Pope's Creek home is fascinating to, to visit because just a, a couple of miles down the road is the home of, of the Lee family. And it's wonderful to contrast the different styles of, of, um, of living of the two um, aristocracies. They were totally uh, different aristocracies, and it, it's just it's fascinating to come here and to, and to see all that, that Fredericksburg and the surrounding area has to offer. And I thank Mr. Smith and uh, Mr. Reese so much for this, this very informative uh, session today. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for the call. Who was in George Washington's cabinet? His, it, it evolved over time, but his original cabinet, probably as impressive as any in American history, uh, you had Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury, Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State, Henry Knox was Secretary of War, uh, Edmund Randolph, Virginian, became Attorney General. There was no Justice Department at that point. Basically the Attorney General was a legal advisor to the President and in fact he was perfectly free to compete for private legal business with New York's 121 other lawyers. Do you know how many people were in the Senate and the House in those days? There were 95 members of the first Congress and of course you figure there were 11 states when Washington became President because neither North Carolina nor Rhode Island had ratified the Constitution so 22 senators about 73 representatives did the people vote for the president in 1789? 1789, no, they, they, they did not. It was uh, uh, the Electoral College unanimously. George Washington, of course, remains the only, the only president to be unanimously selected twice uh, by the Electoral College. So there was absolutely no one that went in and pulled the lever like we do today that elected the electors? There was no popular participation as we know it. When was the first time there was? Well, let me see. There was, uh, I think, by the election of 1800. Uh, yeah, there was there was a popular voting going John on in 1800. Uh, that when Thomas Jefferson referred to it as the Revolution of 1800, and in fact, from Jefferson's viewpoint, part of the revolution was an increasingly popular participation in the uh, semi-direct election of the president. The irony, of course, is that it took the House of Representatives um, to to choose the president in 1801. Salmon, Idaho. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Lamb. Congratulations on your programming. Thanks for calling. Um, I would. I heard that uh, George Washington received a gift of a Catalonian Jack uh, called Royal Gift, and that he was uh, very instrumental in developing the American Mule. And uh, can you can you dis uh, discuss that? Yeah, it was actually it was a gift from the King of Spain, and Washington, who again was a very practical. Um, experimental kind of um, farmer actually envisioned, <laughs> it's hard to believe, envisioned having uh, mules pull his, uh, his coach of state. Fortunately, it, uh, it never happened. Byron, Illinois. You're on with Richard Norton Smith. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask the gentleman if they could uh, expand upon the fact that uh, George Washington originally uh, was the original uh, originator of the, of the American Navy. Uh, he uh, commissioned and uh, uh, procured uh, schooners to block, uh, to uh, capture uh, the British uh, merchantmen supplying Boston. Great program. Hope, hope you'll keep going with this one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, actually, he in particular he relied upon the fishermen of Marblehead, Massachusetts. John Glover was their leader. Uh, but it was, as you might imagine, very much an ad hoc kind of, uh, of effort against the greatest naval power in the world. And I have to, I think, take exception with you because I think most historians would say, give John Adams credit where credit is due. I think John Adams is generally regarded as, uh, uh, as the father of the Navy, the, the, the first president who actually saw to it that there was significant federal appropriations to create and maintain uh, a Navy worthy of the name. Did George Washington have a temper? George Washington had a fierce temper. He spent a lifetime trying to control it. 
And uh, his presidential secretary, Tobias Weir, said no sound on earth compared with that of George Washington swearing a blue streak. Uh, Thomas Jefferson preserved the scene at one particularly contentious cabinet meeting of Washington throwing his hat on the floor and stamping on it. Uh, but again, Washington's whole life is an exercise in self-discipline. Uh, Milton said of Cromwell that he had to govern himself before he could govern England. Washington spent a lifetime governing himself. Who were his closest friends? Well, he didn't have a lot of close friends. Um, Dr. Craik, who attended him in his uh, final illness, was, uh, was very close to him. Um, He, he, was more, um, he, he was more of a mentor, I would say. Uh, there were a lot of particularly younger people uh, whom he uh, brought along, trained to some degree. Uh, Hamilton was, uh, was a good example of that, both in the Revolution and later in, in, in the presidency. Um, Washington once said, he told his, his nephew Bushrod that true growth is, a, a true friendship is a plant of slow growth. Uh, I think he maintained a certain distance from, from people. Next week, we'll be with the John Adams story up in Quincy, Massachusetts. Lieberg, Oregon. Good morning. Good morning, Brian. God bless C-SPAN. Is, is, <laughs> thank you. Is Lieberg named after Robert E. Lee? No, it isn't. It's named after Leander Cruzon, the first postmaster. <laughs> it's L-E-A. Interesting. Thanks. What, uh, what's on your mind this morning? Uh, when you spoke of Francis Tavern, uh, I, I recall that Washington set up the Order of Cincinnati, and I was wondering something about the, the founding of that order and the current status of this hereditary honor. Thanks. Thank well, that was a source of some controversy. <clears throat> In fact, Washington almost did not attend the uh, Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. Uh, in part because the, uh, the Society of the Cincinnati uh, were going to be meeting there. Washington was, in fact, their president general. Uh, it was more of an honorary position than anything else. But even then, there was a growing movement by democratic elements who believed that self-perpetuating, hereditary, semi-aristocratic societies, even societies made up of, uh, of officers from the Revolution, could pose a threat to popular government. And uh, Washington, I think it's safe to say over time, distanced himself somewhat from the Society of the Cincinnati. And of course, he did attend the Constitutional Convention, without which probably there would have been no Constitution. Now, what would you think it would have been like or would be like if all of a sudden Richard Norton Smith found himself sitting at the dinner table just with Martha and George Washington? Just the, just the three of you. Well, first of all, you'd better be on time. He was very punctual. Uh, he waited five minutes. Every Thursday afternoon, he had a state dinner as president. And he waited five minutes, and then he went in and sat down and started eating. And if you showed up, he said, I have a cook who's too punctual for you, uh, which was a very polite way of needling uh, the, the latecomer. Um, do, do you think you would be nervous if you were there? I should be, <laughs> but I probably wouldn't. <laughs> Remember, I spent 10 years you know, living with this man. So... Uh, <laughs> No, you I think, think you would talk. What kind of things would you talk about? Well, it's very interesting. William McClay, who was a not particularly friendly uh, legislator from Pennsylvania, preserved a diary, and he talked about how boring the conversations were. But you have to remember, you're the first president. You have to be very careful what you say and what you don't say, because even so much as a raised eyebrow, under those circumstances, might be read for political meaning. Uh, in fact, by all accounts, Washington was a very hospitable host. One reason he overspent his salary. Uh, he was abstemious himself. He drank very little. He usually uh, settled for one course uh, himself while encouraging his, uh, his guests to, uh, to dine lavishly. Uh, he was fond of salt cod. Uh, he liked pineapples, uh, venison, hair, as prepared by, by the First Lady. Had a staff of 14 in the presidential mansion. And uh, at the end of dinner, uh, he would always raise the same toast, all our friends. Here at Mount Vernon, people noticed he was even more informal. Uh, court dress would give way to buckskin breeches. A dinner was at 2 o'clock every afternoon, uh, often a, uh, a ham, fowl, beef. Again, Washington ate relatively little. 
and we would usually stay for an hour or so after the meal was concluded to engage in conversation with his dinner guest. He, he once likened Mount Vernon to a well-resorted tavern. You have to remember, this was the most famous man in the world. The room you were just looking at, I, wonder, I don't know if we can go back to that or not, uh, that is the, the new room, so-called, the banquet hall. It's a very elegant dining room, which was added on to the original house in the 1770s and then uh, finished with this elegant plaster work uh, in the 1780s. He entertained Lafayette here. It was this room in which uh, Washington was notified in April 1789 that he had been, in fact, elected president of the United States. It was this room as well. The night he died, uh, within two hours of his death, his, room, his body was brought down, placed in front of the fireplace, that great Palladian window, uh, of course, bathed in moonlight, uh, this was, again, Washington, the self-taught architect. Our program today is being directed by Steve Carpenter, and Jim Reese has moved to another room. Before I ask you about the room, how many Washingtons are there in the United States? Do you have any idea? Oh, there, there are thousands and thousands of people who descend from the Washington family, and another thousand and thousands that descend from Martha's family. And there's actually a Washington family organization that has reunions quite frequently. How many towns in America or counties are named after Washington? Any idea? Uh, hundreds and hundreds. And we're actually sending out a bicentennial kit to each of those towns, trying to get them to celebrate the George Washington bicentennial in 1999. The bicentennial of what? The bicentennial of his death. And we look at it as a, as a time to celebrate his life and his legacies on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of his death. The date? The date? actual date of his death is December 14th and we're actually going to reenact his funeral on December 18th uh, 1999 where right here at Mount Vernon following in the exact footsteps of the funeral procession 200 years ago interestingly that'll be two days before our last president series stop which would be President Clinton on December the 20th we have a call from Washington DC go ahead please Hello. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for seeing Stan, and I'm talking to some of the uh, two of the best knowledgeable people in the country, Brian. Uh, Richard, I have a question. Yeah. Two questions for you, real quick. Uh, I wanted to ask about the Washington Jefferson relationship. It certainly soured at the end, and most of Washington's biographers uh, fault Jefferson for the rift. Uh, apparently, uh, he's accused of being disloyalty periodically. Uh, the other question I have is which of the more recent presidents of our time have taken inspiration from? Washington. We certainly know Lincoln read Parson Weems as a young man and talked about it a lot. Uh, Woodrow Wilson wrote a biography of uh, Washington once. And uh, in our time, I suspect Eisenhower studied the military strategies, but you don't hear him quoted by any of the others. So I wonder if you've come across any of that in your readings. Thanks. Well, the, yeah, good questions. Uh, you know, with Jefferson, you never want to make categorical statements. He's such a subtle, complex figure. But it is safe to say that there was a, a certain mutual disappointment on both sides. Uh, and in fact, I would argue that it was part of Washington's genius as a politician. First of all, he convinced everyone that he wasn't a politician, including himself. But in fact, it was a very uh, gifted politician who managed to keep both Jefferson and Hamilton inside his cabinet long after each man uh, wanted to, to leave. Uh, in terms of modern presidents, yeah, there's no doubt that Dwight Eisenhower is probably uh, the closest to uh, a modern Cincinnati, uh, if you will. Uh, Eisenhower admired Lincoln, but he uh, idolized Washington. Um, I think in some ways um, you have a political general. Uh, part of Washington's real gifts during the Revolution were not perhaps necessarily as much a military strategy as uh, they were the political gifts of basically persevering, keeping this cause together. Uh, you saw that, of course, with Ike in World War II. Uh, and I think Eisenhower also saw himself as president, as a reluctant politician, a citizen politician, if you will, uh, and that's certainly in the tradition of George Washington. In a moment, I want to give you that telephone number again that you can call for C-SPAN in the classroom and get involved in all this. Jim Reese, how did you get involved in George Washington in the first place? Well, I came from the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Alpern about 15 years ago. I must admit, at that time, I had the same impression of Washington that I think many people had today and that's that he's great but not terribly interesting and I've come full circle to believe and understand that Washington is not just the most powerful man of the 18th century but by far and away the most fascinating and we try to show that more and more at Mount Vernon. Alright, if you were just starting out in this whole business and knowing now 
what you didn't know then and you wanted to study George Washington, give us, I asked the two of you, where would you go and what would you read? Well, you'd have to start by reading Richard's book, of course, but, <laughs> but from then on, I think you've got a lot of good choices. I think James Flexner's uh, books on George Washington are great. I think Douglas Southall Freeman's books on Washington are wonderful. I think that the papers of George Washington, which are being issued from the University of Virginia, are well worth looking at by scholars. People don't understand Washington was one of the most prolific writers we've ever had of any president. And we, we know he wrote at least 40,000 letters, many of which are in our files at the Library of Congress, and they deserve a lot more attention than they're receiving today. How much material, uh, Rick Smith, is at uh, the Library of Congress? Oh, a vast amount, that actually. Most of One of the real tragedies, you have to remember, uh, here I'll speak up for the modern presidential library system. By law, everything has to be saved, preserved, a processed and made available to scholars. That was not the case in George Washington's day. And in fact, it is uh, nothing short of an intellectual outrage how his papers were scattered. Uh, his first uh, biographer, one of his early biographers, actually Jared Sparks, later president of Harvard, actually cut up Washington's uh, manuscripts and uh, provided them to autograph seekers. So parts of, the, parts of that corpus are gone forever. Well, much of it's at the Library of Congress. Lake Tahoe, California, thanks for waiting. Oh, no problem. Thank you very much for having me on. First of all, I'd like to say, Mr. Lamb, I've, I've been uh, a C-SPAN viewer, adamant C-SPAN viewer, for 15, 18 years now. And I took this opportunity to call and tell you that I think of all the people in America today, you are the one, you, Mr. Brian Lamb, are the one that, to me, most uh, uh, exemplifies the dignity that I see in your personal public persona of George Washington. Along those same lines, Mr. Smith, you mentioned that uh, Washington spent his life in uh, uh, trying to define himself before he would, he would uh, attempt to lead the country. Along those same lines, what do you think uh, he would think of uh, Bill Clinton? Would you take that one for me? This is going to sound evasive no matter what I say. Just as I think it is unfair for someone today to pass judgment on someone 200 years earlier, so I'm reluctant to try to put into uh, the, uh, the head of a man dead for 200 years uh, his, uh, his interpretation of events that perhaps not all of us fully understand at this point. Um, I'll, I'll uh, respectfully pass. Jim Reese, where are you? Right up in the uh, third floor now, where the top level of the mansion right under the cupola. What was in this room? Well, we're in a, there were three bedrooms on this floor and some storage rooms. These were the less important bedrooms, which is why it's so interesting that after George Washington died, Martha closed off the master bedroom and moved into this very, very simple bedroom for the last two and a half years of her life. And for a long time, we didn't know how she survived because we didn't have a fireplace in this room, and it gets very cold in Mount Vernon, until we investigated in this wall over here and found the remains of an old Franklin-style fireplace. And we found an original one and installed it a few years ago, just where we think she had that fireplace. Why did she move up there? Well, it was tradition in the 18th century to close off the master bedroom for at least a few weeks. We don't know exactly why she closed it off and never went back, but the theory is that she was so close to her husband that the memories in that bedroom were so, so strong she just couldn't, couldn't take it. So she moved up here somewhat to get away from that bedroom, also to get away from the hundreds of guests who were coming to Mount Vernon all the time. We know that in one year alone, more than 600 people spent the night here. It really was a well-resorted tavern, and I think at that time in her life, she wanted solitude. We are looking at the uh, room from the outside of Mount Vernon, and this is not a room open to the public. Why not? Well, no, it is open to the public, but just one month a year. You can see the third floor during our holidays program, which is from December 1st all the way through January 6th. I, I might also mention, Brian, that if you want to know more about these programs at Mount Vernon, you can go to our website, which is mountvernon.org. And we also have a special George Washington Bicentennial website, which is gwashington1999.org. I really recommend, if you want to know more about what's going on, to try those two websites. What about just those folks that never have uh, the access to the web? What do they do? 
Well, what you can do is you can, you can go to one of the cities where our traveling, we have two traveling shows that are out there now. We're happy to send you an educational kit for the classroom. We're publishing nine or ten new books this year. Um, I know that Richard agrees. We've got to do everything we possibly can to get George Washington back out there. Because even though times change, you know, we, we believe very strongly that character and leadership don't change. And that people today can learn just as much from Washington's character and leadership as they did 200 years ago. New York City, you're next. Good morning, Brian. Barry morning. Coulard, again. Um, you are the greatest, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of this series. I think you've done a fabulous job already, and it's just going to get better. Uh, thank you for bringing up the question about the Washington families across the United States, because I am a genealogist, and my question for Mr. Smith is to, to talk just a little bit about the ancestry of Washington. I go frequently beyond the American Revolution in my research, and I know his family came from England. I believe they came from a place called Masham, M-A-S-H-A-M, in England, and I just don't know how many generations removed he was from the original ancestors that came to this country and that sort of thing. So if he could just address some ancestral questions, I'd be very pleased. Thank you very much. Well, let me, let me do my best. I'm not a genealogist, I'm afraid, and um, the bulk of my research dealt with Washington's later years, but I can tell you uh, that it was his great-grandfather, John Washington, uh, who I believe in 1674 uh, settled here. And, um, again, was the recipient of a grant of about 6,000 acres uh, from uh, Charles II. Uh, it, it, one sort of interesting thing is the, uh, the, uh, the English Washingtons, in fact, uh, inhabit or inhabited a place, uh, I believe it's called Soulgrave Manor, which uh, is a stone's throw from Althorpe House. And uh, prior to the uh, death of uh, Princess Diana, uh, that, in fact, was the great tourist attraction and Great Brington, which of course is the small village just outside Althorpe Estate. Um, so Washington's family, in fact, sank roots pretty deeply into this country um, in the 17th century. Uh, his father, Augustine, in fact, was only fairly, fairly recently discovered that his father, Augustine, um, inhabited this property in the 1730s. The assumption was that the Pope's Creek and then Ferry Farm, there was no interval. But in fact, um, the family did live here. So George Washington actually lived here at Mount Vernon uh, long before it was called Mount Vernon uh, as, a, as a child. That, uh, the recent shot, was is Bob Riley on that camera upstairs? That, I don't know if we can get that back again, but he, this is the kind of thing that our colleagues at C-SPAN who work with cameras on their back, love to do. <laughs> and I know that he's having, this is the time of his life right here, he's up in the cupola looking around Mount Vernon, with a camera on his shoulder and looking at the Potomac River as you'll see off here to the left. And you can see we've got a camera on the outside that you can Nick show Rogers. in just a moment. You'll see where Bob Riley is standing in the cupola itself. He can also show on the lawn one of our other camera people, and there he is. And that camera will pull back and we'll show you where he's shooting from. Quite a view from and, Mount Vernon. And again, Washington, the self-taught architect of that building looks flawless. I mean, you know, just absolutely the proportions, the symmetry, uh, the cupola is perfect, the weather vane, the, literally the crowning touch. Uh, and this was not done with professional architects. This was done by George Washington. Jim Marie's, are you still hooked up? I sure am. What's the favorite room here? Uh, my favorite room is the one you're sitting in, believe it or not. What's it called? It's called the West Parlor. And what I think I like about it is the fact that it was used for so many different things. I like telling people that George Washington liked to play cards now and then, that he could gamble when he felt like it. Um, that's the room that Martha often adjourned to, to have tea with her best friends. And I think it's really probably the most elegant room in the house as well. Salem, Oregon, you're next. Yes, hi. Thank you for taking my question. I'm really looking forward to the rest of the series. I have two questions, if I might. Um, I have read some uh, books about Mr. Washington, and I was curious as to what the nature of his relationship with his mother was, because from some of my readings, I, I sense that perhaps it was strained at times that they both quite weren't meeting each other's expectations. And my second question is, um, what were George Washington's feelings regarding his fellow Virginian, Patrick Henry? Jim Reese, mother? Well, there's a lot of controversy about George Washington's relationship to his mother, and quite frankly, I don't think it was terribly good. 
It was, um, there are even some people who think that she wasn't very supportive during the Revolutionary War. I do think you have to give George Washington's mother credit for a couple of things. One is that when he was very young, he was going to run away and join the British Navy, and she absolutely forbade him from doing that. And of course, that changed the course of history. And I think she was also a pretty tough woman. And I think being a, a tough mother, you know, providing tough love, if you will, probably was part of George Washington's training. And I think that probably made him a better man. Richard Smith, Patrick Henry. Uh, Patrick Henry, uh, well, uh, they were um, on opposite sides of the fence politically. Uh, Patrick Henry opposed the Constitution, in which George Washington had, of course, invested all of his prestige. Ironically, a dozen years later, in the last year of his life, Patrick Henry has become a, a political conservative, uh, a supporter of the, uh, of the Washington administration, and Washington actually appealed to Henry unsuccessfully to, uh, to run for the Virginia Assembly. Houston, Texas, you're next. Brian, don't ever complain about too many, not enough people calling into C-SPAN. <laughs> you told us to do our homework so that we could uh, really add something to this, and I believe I have. Let me tie in just a couple colors uh, statements and then a uh, uh, statement of my own. First of all, you're talking about Patrick Henry right there. Somebody also called about Benjamin Rush being his personal physician. I'm not sure that that's true. Um, actually, I heard, I read that uh, Benjamin Rush was not uh, in favor of the, the way uh, George Washington was do, doing under, you know, the, the hospitals during the Revolutionary War, and he wrote an anonymous letter to Patrick Henry stating that uh, he didn't, he wanted Washington to be removed. Uh, Patrick Henry gave it to George Washington. George Washington recognized the handwriting and really didn't like Benjamin Rush very much after that. Um, since the, the Tocqueville tour, I, I've I've really been wondering what y'all were going to do next, and bingo, right on the money. It's great to see that you don't ever set your sights too low. Uh, George Washington sat in a chair in the Continental Congress, which had a sun on the back of it, and an argument broke out if it was a rising or a setting sun. Um, Benjamin Franklin said that it was a rising sun. I have to agree with that, and even if it turns out to be a cloudy day, C-SPAN has got to be the silver lining. In Philadelphia, there, uh, there's a city tavern, and, and they have a Washington Ale, uh, that, that Washington supposedly drank, and, and it makes me laugh because he, he, I remember whenever I studied him at, at a young age, he was always able to appear and disappear when he was cornered by the British. And uh, I thought, it, drinking some of that ale, I'm sure I can see why. And Caller, one last what, thing. Yeah, well, let me just weaver, ask you a question. Go ahead. <laughs> the weaver, uh, uh, the man who said, made up the story about George Washington chopping down the tree, I'm glad to see, to have a name attached to that. I'm just wondering what was he thinking by making up a story about somebody telling the, 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 telling the truth, which is a lie, to children. What are you doing, Houston? Uh, well, actually, I'm working on a little project like what you're doing, but uh, I'll get back to you on that whenever I'm a little bit further along, and I'm looking very <laughs> forward to it. All right, thanks. What about Parson Weems? Well, Parson Weems, you know, was at the school of improving literature. And after all, the whole point of history and biography wasn't necessarily supposed to be uh, factual. Uh, it was supposed to have set a moral example. We have video, uh, by the way, of the rising sun there on the back of a chair there at the Independence Hall. We have video of Independence Hall. Have you been there? Yeah, it's spectacular. What, what, Every American what happened visit. there? Well, what didn't happen there? That, that was the real capital of the United States. For uh, That, of course, is the building in which the Declaration was approved. That is the building uh, where Washington was designated commander-in-chief. Um, that was the building where he returned in the summer of 1787 to preside over the Constitutional Convention. Um, the wings of that building, Congress Hall um, in particular, housed uh, the uh, Senate and the House uh, for most of the 1790s. Um, that is the building where America began. Jim Reese, do people ever rent this home out for big dinners in Washington? No, uh, we don't really rent Mount Vernon. We've got so many visitors coming both day and night that we just don't have the ability to rent Mount Vernon. We do have a wonderful restaurant outside the gates that is used for, for parties fairly often. And that can be combined with a private evening tour, and those have become very, very popular over the last few years. How much money does it cost you to maintain this place in a year? 
Well, you know, our budget this year in total is about $24 million, and it grows higher and higher in each year. For instance, replacing the roof just a few years ago was more than a million dollars. We just installed our first um, HVAC system, climate control system. That cost more than a million dollars. Because Mount Vernon is the most important historic home in America, we don't cut corners. We do always the most first-rate restoration we possibly can. By the way, where did you go to school? Um, I went to the College of William Mary again in Williamsburg and then went to George Washington University. What did you study? Um, I studied English and history. What else? <laughs> Richard Smith, you went to I, Harvard. I went and to Harvard. studied what? And I studied government. Fresno, California. You're our next caller. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. Lamb, good morning. Nice idea for a program. I wish you had more of them like this. Uh, my question for Mr. Smith is, during the French-Indian War, uh, one of my ancestors, William Bernal, was a captain under, under George Washington. After the war, they shared a land grant. And uh, George Washington and another uh, one of his partners bought the land that was the share of the Bernal family. And I'm curious if there are any records that I could get that I could find where the land was and which parcel it was. And interesting. I'll take the answer off the air. Yeah, interesting question. I'm, I suspect those records would exist. I'm not sure. You, you, you might actually direct that question to the folks here at Mount Vernon who could perhaps send you somewhere else. I don't know the National Archives. Jim Reese, do you know? I, I don't know the answer to that specific question. I know that Washington has been criticized somewhat for accepting the best pieces of land after his service in the Virginia War. But in fact, he was the highest ranking officer, so I don't think many people find that unusual. Fresno, California, you're next. No, Philadelphia, you're next. Hello. Hi, you're on the air. Thanks. George Washington, I'm sorry, uh, Mount Vernon has been described as everything but what it was, which was a slave plantation. And George Washington has been described as everything but what he was, which was a slave owner and a white supremacist. Um, can I get any comment on that from either of these gentlemen? Let me ask you, caller, what, what, now that you've, you've said that, what, what do you want us to do with it? Well, I want, I would, I, I understand that this is a bit of a celebration and a love fest, but though, don't you think that those aspects of him and of Mount Vernon were uh, consequential. Well, just so you'll know, it's not meant to be a celebration nor a love fest, so that's why the phones are open. You obviously have thought more about this, so why don't you give us more? What do you want me to give you? Well, tell us more why you, you want this, people to know this, and what, what um, I mean, do you think that this shouldn't happen, that Mount Vernon shouldn't be here, or well, people shouldn't visit it? Well, in my opinion, um, American history uh, serves um, both academic and political ends, and one of the one of the consequences of that is the mythologizing of American history. Uh, uh, George Washington was a founder and an upholder of a very uh, brutal system uh, relative to the human beings who found themselves. Uh, in the position of slaves. I've heard people call and talk about how um, their visits to Mount Vernon brought wonderful feelings and memories and so forth, but um, there were people who lived there at that time uh, who, who could not avail themselves of those wonderful feelings. And George Washington is, of course, looked upon as what's commonly called a founding father. Uh, of a country whose uh, basic concepts were that of human value and human freedom. Uh, and there's a gross contradiction in that reality and the, um, and the portrayal of American history and George Washington and subjects like that. And I would just like to get people's comments on that who, I, who do not appear to me to have that perspective. Have you been here? No, I would never go there. Well, if, you, if you've been watching the television, you've just seen the slave quarters here that are on display and the slave graves and all that. Yeah. Uh, wh why would you never come here? I would never visit a slave plantation in, in, any, um, in any attempt to glorify it or, or to ex uh, accept it as something valid. 
Well, but why do you think it was a slave plantation and nothing more? Why do you think visiting an area like this would be validating it? Well, certainly to believe that it was um, some sort of uh, <clears throat> hallowed historical ground of some kind, or to um, or to lend my my own uh, presence to the uh, the rather uncritical look at um, George Washington, the institution of slavery, um, his uh, his deep seated belief that uh, Africans were inferior people um, uh, is something that is repugnant to me. Okay, thanks, Jim Reese. I think that that's the feeling of, of some people. I think we have other African Americans who like working with Mount Vernon to show what it was like to be a slave in the 18th century. We try to, to show that side as well. There's a, a slave life tour that we do daily. We have, of course, built the slave memorial. Um, we work with a wonderful group called Black Women United for Action to plan educational programs and one very, very moving ceremony honoring the work of the slaves every September. I think if, if we're going to face this problem head on, this, this challenging issue head on, Mount Vernon might be a place to do that because I think we, we can look at it from an historical perspective and try to look at it from every point of view. Richard Smith. Well, I think, <clears throat> to be sure, you shouldn't mythologize American history. But neither should you teach it as a catalog of crimes or an ideological exercise. What did George Washington give us? George Washington gave us a government that is capable of change, of evolution. In 1787, 55 white men, the elite of the colonies, met in a room in Philadelphia. 200 years later, it is a vastly more representative government more democratic government, more inclusive government, but it is all those things because of the institutions that were created in that room and that were sanctioned by the involvement of George Washington. Fort Stockton, Texas, you're next. Hello. Hi. Uh, this is Florence Cummings. I heard someone call in a while ago about uh, how you would find some genealogy on George Washington, and I could recommend several sources. Uh, the Genealogical Publishing Company in Baltimore publishes uh, or has published a series um, that was from Tyler's Quarterly on Virginia families, also one from William and Mary's, and I have both of them. There's multiple volume books, but they do have uh, some Washington information in them. Another source is... Uh, a two-volume set called, uh, just a second, I'm looking for the title page, Old Churches, Ministers, and Families of Virginia by Bish William Mead. And uh, this has about a lot of the old families in Virginia, and he will find some things in that. One of the most interesting set of books I have, uh, you order from... Uh, Mrs. Malcolm H. Harris in West Point, Virginia. All right, thank you. Jim Reese, uh, you want to say something? Yeah, the, the, we go back to the new room, if we could go back to that camera in the, uh, the banquet hall, because it, again, uh, will uh, show a side of Washington that a lot of people may not suspect. That, by the way, is a trestle table. Um, there were so many visitors who came to this house, no one knew how many would be here for dinner. So they basically set up sawhorses and trestles, something Washington first did in the Revolution. But if you look around that room, you will find an impressive collection of artwork. And Washington was, among other things, Washington had much greater aesthetic uh, interest than most people suspect. He was a lifelong theater goer. He enjoyed music. There is, in effect, a music room in this house with a harpsichord that uh, he bought for uh, Nelly. Landscapes <coughs> were the, con were the uh, avant-garde art of the 18th century. Uh, portraits were much more favored. Uh, in fact, if you look around this house, you will find a number of landscapes that suggest Washington's artistic taste 
were as advanced as, advanced as some of his agricultural interests. There were at one time 21 paintings and engravings that hung on the walls of that single room. As you said earlier, I want to give you the telephone number to call if you're interested in becoming a participant of C-SPAN in the classroom. And that's for teachers, those of you who want to join up and uh, doesn't cost you anything. Uh, available to you be a lot of video and, and um, teachers' uh, lesson plans. The number is 202-626-4858. That's 202-626-4858. We have about 10 minutes left in our program here today. Jim Reese is upstairs, and we have Richard Norton Smith here in uh, our room right off the entrance, and it is an open day here at Mount Vernon. Uh, we have a call from Stafford Springs, Connecticut next. Go ahead, please. Hi, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you very much for this show. What a wonderful, wonderful program this morning. I visited Mount Vernon several years ago. I believe it was when they were fixing the roof, and it was just breathtaking. I plan to come back again um, soon. I have two comments for you this morning. Uh, first is I wonder if any of you um, had seen the uh, broadcast several years ago. Uh, Hallmark Hall of Fame, I believe, did a series on the Flexner novels with uh, Barry Bostwick and Patty Duke Aston. Um, on the life of George Washington and the forming of the new nation. I thought it was wonderful, and I just wonder if any of you saw it as well. And my second comment is um, I've been doing a lot of reading personally on my own regarding George Washington. I was wondering, um, I came up with sort of a theory I thought I'd run by you. Um, I believe that he was destined to become who he was, all the things that happened during the war with his close calls and riding so close to the front and not getting shot and then becoming our first president. I believe he was destined to be who he was, and um, I think if he had had his own children by Martha and himself, would he have been as committed to the war and the country as he was? Um, I mean, he sacrificed his whole life uh, to bring this country to being, and I was just wondering, um, I think uh, um, he wouldn't have been committed. I was just wondering if, if you guys felt the same. If he had had his own children at home, would he have been as committed to the country? I'll hang up and listen. Thank you so very much. Thanks. Jim Reese, did, um, do you remember the Hallmark Hall of Fame? Well, really, I don't think it was Hallmark Hall of Fame. I think it was a CBS series that took place almost 20 years ago now that did indeed star Barry Boswick, who's a good friend of Mount Vernon, as George Washington. The first part of that series, I've been told, was one of the highest ranking miniseries ever produced, and millions and millions of people got a new feeling about George Washington, in part because that series showed him as a young man, and I think that's one of the things we have to do to show Washington not as just the sour-looking older statesman on the dollar bill, but this strapping, athletic young man who was in, uh, exploring the wilderness and leading our troops at the age of 23. He was an action hero of the 18th century. By the way, Jack Warren, a historian who's worked on some of the Washington papers, will be on C-SPAN's website for a chat room starting at noon, which if you're watching this live, is in about 35 minutes. That's noon East Coast time. What about children, uh, Mr. Smith? Do you think that uh, had he had children, he wouldn't have been able to devote as much time? Well, he would have found a, he would have found a way. But I think probably the caller has something. Uh, it's interesting. I'd never thought about it that way. But uh, I think the country was lucky that uh, Washington, in fact, was able to focus his enormous energies upon uh, this country. Wheelis, Oklahoma. You're next. Hi, this is Linda Revere from Wheelis, Oklahoma. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, why did the government move uh, so many times from New York to um, uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia, then then on to Washington? I know that probably because of Washington D.C. wasn't as big a city in those days as it is now. But um, why did they have to move? Uh, three times before Thanks. they uh, became established? Good question. A very good question. The first government in New York in 1789, there were more people working for George Washington here at Mount Vernon than in the entire executive branch of government. The first federal budget was about $2 million. The Army numbered about 600 men. You get the, you get the picture. Why did it move from New York to Philadelphia? Basically, there was a political deal. Uh, involving Hamilton and his followers and Jefferson and his followers and in the background uh, as was his want was George Washington who very much wanted to see the future capital of the United States uh, on the Potomac 
And so uh, an arrangement was made, in effect, that uh, the capital would move from New York to Philadelphia for 10 years, during which work would uh, begin on creating, from scratch, a capital city for the United States. A capital city, I would remind you, that at that point would be more or less midway uh, between uh, Maine and, uh, and Georgia. And by the way, a, a congressman from South Carolina proposed that the new city be named Washingtonopolis. Never happened. Jim Reese, uh, you told us earlier that there are a million people that visit here every year, that the fee is about $8 and that you need $24 million to run this place. I, I look at about a shortcoming there of about $16 million. Where do you get it? Well, we, we also have a very successful gift shop and a restaurant operation, and we get some nice donations from the American people. Mount Vernon has never received federal support, so we really do count on the generosity of the American people. Brian, I might also say that um, some of the things that you've seen today um, are only for 1999, and we have a brand new museum operation that just opened that includes George Washington's last will and testament, and we have a brand new multimedia experience called Washington is No More, which shows the kind of emotions surrounding Washington's death. Even if you've been to Mount Vernon once, twice, five times, ten times before, I really encourage you to come again in 1999 because some of these things are going to go away next year, and I'd hate for you to miss them. How many people work here? Oh gosh, in the, in the heaviest seasons we have up to 400 workers, and in addition to that we have about 350 sensational volunteers. Two calls left. Leslie, Georgia, next. Go ahead, please. Yeah, my question is, why are there no uh, uh, white people, uh, um, not many of any kind of people, named whose last name is Washington? Uh, a friend was telling me about this, and uh, and, I, and he told me something that was, uh, and I, I, that I've forgotten, uh, but I, and I didn't understand it then, but I looked in a book here of, of, with a, of a city of over 100,000 people, and there's no Washington black or white. There's not a Washington name. Thanks. Anybody know that, uh, answer that question? Uh, Jim Reese? I, I have no idea. In fact, I just, I, I meet so many Washingtons in my job that I think they're all around. What can I say? <laughs> Saranac Lake, New York. Last call. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. I, good morning. Good morning. I have, a, um, I have a question for Mr. Smith uh, regarding George Washington's relationships with uh, the Iroquois Indians. I understand that... Uh, during the bad winter of Valley Forge, that a number of Indians hand carried food supplies down into Valley Forge to help save uh, Washington's troops. Then, within a year and a half, Washington had the same Indians' uh, orchards and so forth up in the Mohawk Valley, in New York State, uh, destroyed by fire. So, I'm wondering what the relationship was with George Washington with Indians that uh, fought, on, fought on both sides of the war at that particular time. Thanks. My understanding is the Iroquois, in fact, sided with the British. And this was a very complex, very delicate uh, situation where you had some Indian tribes that, in effect, were siding with, with the colonists, uh, but you had others who were uh, pro-British. And, in fact, a major element of the British strategy for winning the war was to enlist as many Indian allies as possible. To, uh, to make war upon the American frontier. Mark Farkas is producer of our series, and we're near the end. Uh, George Washington was one of eight presidents born in Virginia. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, John Tyler, William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, and Woodrow Wilson. 19 of 41 presidents were born in New York, Ohio, or Virginia. He was 57 when he became president, so was Thomas Jefferson, and so was James Madison. Any other little things about George Washington that uh, you like to tell people, uh, Jim Reese? Well, um, Thomas Jefferson thought he was the best horseback rider in all Virginia. Um, I think he, as Richard said, he was a great, great farmer. We, we are very proud he introduced the mule to America, as one of your callers said. But most of all, you just can't forget what a, what a remarkable character this man had. And I think that a hundred years from now, someone will be coming back like you, Brian, to do this show all over again because character doesn't change. It's, it's as important now as it's ever been. This should be our last call. Culpepper, Virginia. Go ahead, please. Hello. This is, uh, I'm calling from Culpepper, and the young George Washington surveyed our town in 1749, 
and we're celebrating the 250th anniversary this uh, spring and going on events all through the year. And I thought it might be interesting. What are some of the events you have going on? Well, we're going to have a lot of things uh, organized around the town of Culpeper. And I can give you a phone number. People can call the uh, Department sure. of Tourism. Go ahead. It's 540-727-3410. And they'll get brochures and information about our town. And George Washington was pretty prominent. We have a number of uh, buildings and uh, activities dedicated to him and early colonial history in the town. 540-727-3410. Yeah. That's right. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we are just about out of town. He was one of um, 13 or 11 Episcopalian presidents. Why so many Episcopalians in the early years? Well, they were, first of all, they were a large proportion of the population, but they were certainly part of the colonial elite, the power elite of the 18th century. We are out of time, and we want to thank Jim Reese, who is the resident director of the Mount Vernon what, 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 what's the full title? Mount the, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association of the Union. <laughs> By the way, the obvious question, why did 35 ladies hire a man to run the place? We've always had men running the place, and I think that it's, it's fun for women <laughs> to tell me what to do. What can you say? And Richard Norton Smith, who runs the Gerald Ford Library and Museum, are you working on another, another book? Uh, I might be. I leave you with one great quote. The poet Robert Frost said it best. George Washington is one of the few people in all history who wasn't carried away by power. On that note, we thank you for joining us and on to Quincy, Massachusetts and John Adams. We'll look around Mount Vernon and thank our C-SPAN colleagues, Mark Farkas and Steve Carpenter and their colleagues for bringing us all this today.